so we will start this section with an exercise that people can do standing. So as you are walking towards your seats, we are, we are going to do an exercise uh, that you can do standing. Um, this morning was a really good morning for cosmology and a really uh, good Nobel Prize for Jim Peebles. And before we congratulate him, um, I got an email. Okay. Uh, before we congratulate him, um, I got an email from the Exoverse. Everybody knows what the Exoverse is? Yeah, the Exoplanet people. And they seem to think that they have surpassed cosmology because they seem to think that they got two-thirds of a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but of course they cannot read. <laughs> but I think uh, Jim Peebles is not here. But I am quite confident that we can uh, congratulate him loudly enough that he will be able to hear it in Princeton. So I invite you to congratulate Jim Peebles for a well-deserved Nobel Prize. This is the final panel, and the question put to the panel was, what more can cosmology learn from particle physics? So just one or two minutes on context. Um, sometime uh, in the early 1980s, the coming together of particle physics with cosmology changed the conversation in cosmology. So the conversation had been about Q0, H0, isothermal, adiabatic. There's a handful of people in the room who remember those words. And before people correct me and say, no, 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 you meant to say isocurvature and curvature. No, it was isothermal and adiabatic. To the present lexicon, um, that includes the words quark soup, wimps, dark matter, the omegas, baryogenesis, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, cold dark matter, hot dark matter, uh, self-interacting dark matter, inflation, uh, phase transitions, uh, and of course, dark energy. And I think um, anyone who studies uh, uh, scholarly uh, uh, work in any field, the vocabulary defines what you're doing. So the, the vocabulary in question. So, so that was a very big change that changed the direction of the field, changed the players, changed the kind of uh, equipment we use. And so the question to this panel is, that's why the what more can cosmology learn from particle physics? Uh, what new words need to be added to the lexicon, or do we know enough? And so we have three very distinguished panelists. Uh, we have uh, uh, Nima Arkedi Karmed from the Institute for Advanced Study. We have Jean Judici from CERN, and we have Lisa Randall from Harvard. And it'll be the usual panel format where um, the panelists will present some remarks, no longer than 20 minutes, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up for discussion, first led by uh, the moderator, and then we'll just open it up to everyone. So Nima. All right, well, it's really wonderful to uh, be here. Um, of course, as uh, Michael is uh, reminding us, uh, particle physics and cosmology have a long and storied uh, relationship. I think for a long time it was kind of a one-sided relationship. Uh, particle physics gave and gave and gave. Um, and um, uh, particle physics made early universe cosmology possible by telling us how to think about the universe at temperatures above the QCD scale. Um, it provided all kinds of mechanisms and ideas for dark matter, very dense, et cetera, et cetera as uh, Mike has uh, reviewed. Um, and of course, uh, things changed drastically in the uh, late uh, 1990s when cosmology came back, uh, gave back in a big way with a shovel to the head of fundamental physics with the discovery of the star in the universe. So, um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about um, uh, is, uh, is something different. Uh, something I've been excited about for a number of years, and which uh, actually has to do with a more structural kind of relationship between cosmology and particle physics, 
And some set of ideas that in the beginning uh, might, uh, might, uh, be, uh, might have cosmological consequences informed by particle physics, but will ultimately be about cosmology feeding back and telling us something much more fundamental about just the very structure of the laws of uh, fundamental physics. And uh, uh, the, the broad theme um, uh, that's associated with these uh, ideas is the, is the slogan of time without time. And I'll but just probably have a chance to touch on some of the basic <coughs> ideas. Uh, and again, the sort of uh, names associated with them is uh, beginning with uh, a basic analogy between cosmology and collider physics. Uh, 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 something that, that Juan Maltzana and I a number of years ago called cosmological collider physics. Um, and uh, this work that we did uh, back then is really almost entirely kinematical. It's the analog of how experimentalists in the 1960s could go, go about discovering the massive and spins of new resonances uh, at accelerators. It's finding the analog of that question for measuring the masses and spins of new particles from, uh, from density fluctuations in the sky. Then there are more dynamical aspects of the story that are being developed more recently in collaboration with Daniel uh, Bauman, Hayden Lee, and Nina Mental, uh, and, and a, more, uh, a more radical, speculative, more mathematical direction associated with these things that's been uh, developed with uh, the mathematician Alex Kosnikov and uh, Paul Benicasa. Um, again, the, and, and the, the words associated with the cosmological bootstrap and the, and the idea of cosmological poly. So in 20 minutes, I won't be able to give you uh, to really cover all of these things. I, I hope to be able to tell you enough about the, uh, about the context um, so that uh, uh, you might find it uh, uh, interesting and we might have more of a discussion. All right, um, but let's just begin. So very often uh, when we talk, uh, especially to a journalist, and we talk about inflation, of course, high-scale inflation has always been the sort of most reasonable possibility for how inflation could work. We like to say that inflation is very likely the very highest energy phenomenon that's ever taken place that we have some, some uh, interesting access to in the, in the history of the universe. And then inflation somehow gives us a cosmic accelerator that we don't have access to on a planet Earth. You know, probing energy is perhaps as high as Hubble during inflation. And uh, the, the first part, and the, of course, there could be all sorts of things up there uh, uh, near Hubble at 10 to the 14 GeV. We minimally could have uh, uh, extra scalars. We can have extra dimensions, uh, a la the ideas of Horjava and Witten that, uh, that reconcile the little discrepancy between the straight scale and, uh, and, and the gut scale. These extra dimensions would have to be around 10 to the 14 GeV. We have all sorts of other things going on around 10 to the 14 GeV. We don't need to make a laundry list. But the question is, in what precise sense, if Hubble was 10 to the 14 GeV during inflation, can we think of inflation as an accelerator around 10 to the 14 GeV? After all, when we have a real accelerator, what do we do? First, we have access to things we can collide. Uh, so we get to choose the initial state. And then when we collide them, like uh, uh, when we collide uh, an E plus E minus in and then a mu plus mu minus out, then what we do with it, at, at the, at the minimal first thing we do with it is we do spectroscopy. We look for the presence of new particles by big spikes in the cross section. And by looking at the angular dependence, um, we learn something about the spins of these particles. Okay. So that's what we do with colliders. At colliders, we, uh, we get to control the initial state. And by scanning over energies, we get to see these peaks. And angular dependence tells us about spins. So what is the analog of this in cosmology for the cosmic accelerator? All right, and so this is the, the basic analogy between collider physics and cosmological collider physics. So let's go back and just uh, say uh, slightly more, very slightly more abstractly, um, what we do when we think about ordinary collider physics. Well, to begin with, we have to collide stable particles. Okay, so uh, we collide electrons or we collide protons. Um, and stable particles are detected by being those objects that have a large two-point function. So they have a large two-point function. If it decayed, the two-point function would disappear after the time length of the order of the lifetime of the particle. So the things that are stable have big two-point functions. Once you find the things that are stable, the big two-point functions that don't die or only die in the power law in space, uh, once you find those things, um, uh, there isn't that much more interesting to say about the two-point function itself because it's essentially entirely controlled by Lorentz invariants and the symmetry. The interesting dynamical content is then in the nonlinearities of, of, of what's going on. You scatter two particles in, and you get another set of two particles out. 
What's the analog of this in cosmology? Well, if we assume that we have inflation, and if, even if we assume more, that inflation is of the most minimal variety, uh, where, where there's just sort of one clock that's controlling when inflation ends, uh, so, that, uh, so, so that the physics is controlled by weakly broken approximate consider invariants, then the analogy is almost perfect. Um, we also have an object with a big two-point function. And that, that's the, it's the underlying inflaton or the two-point function that we measure in the sky for, uh, for, uh, for density perturbations or temperature perturbations. Once you know that it's there and it's compatible with these basic symmetries, there's not that much more to learn from studying the two-point function. Of course, if we see the graviton two-point function, it'll be very exciting, right? But just from the scalar two-point function, it's largely controlled by the weakly broken de Sitter invariants. And then all the dynamical information is in the nonlinearities. So it's the uh, so just as here, the presence of resonance is somehow reflected in the nonlinearities involving scatter amplitudes, so the presence of heavy particles uh, should be reflected in the non-Gaussianities, the three-point functions and higher-point functions that might be there, um, uh, uh, generated by inflation. And so just to make the, uh, just to make the analogy even more precise, um, what is it that we measure when we measure three, four higher point function in uh, cosmology, whatever it is that we're doing, uh, we're, we're making measurements at some future spatial surface, at future infinity, and we measure, for example, temperature per perturbations or density perturbations by averaging, by taking products of the density or temperature perturbations in space and keeping the shape of the, of the distances between these shapes fixed and averaging over all shapes. So, and now, so alternatively, we can go to uh, momentum space, the spatial averages give us these functions, sorry, those shouldn't be all pluses, they should be commas, so functions of a bunch of spatial momentum, and translational invariance tells us that we are living on the support of momentum conservation. So what a cosmologist would draw, for example, for a four-point function, is, is a function of a quadrilateral, k1, k2, k3, k4, where the k's add up to zero. Now, particle physicists would draw exactly the same picture with k1 and k2 in, negative k3 and negative k4 out, and call it a scattering process. So the data that labels a cosmological, uh, uh, a cosmological correlator is exactly the same as the data that labels a scattering process. Actually, with one difference, that the uh, cosmological correlator depends on a single extra variable. You see, we have translational invariance, so there's momentum, spatial momentum conservation, but there's no time translational invariance, so we don't have the analog of energy conservation. Okay, so that's so. Uh, in fact, the the wave function or the the cosmological correlators depend on precisely one more variable, which is the sum of all the energies for all the particles, the sum of the magnitude of all the spatial momenta for all the particles, which does not have to equal zero, uh, unlike in the scattering process. Okay, so um, now uh, again, in slightly more detail. If you want to, if you have weakly broken, uh, uh, if you have weakly broken. The center invariance uh, during inflation, what we think of is, for example, an inflationary three-point function is secretly an underlying the center four-point function where one of these inflatons is put to its background. So this is just a little technical remark that we're going to be caring about uh, dominantly about three-point functions in the end, but the basic object underneath it all is something, again, that looks exactly like a scattering process, two in and two out. Okay, so two in, two out, and a particular limit of that uh, gives us what we care about uh, for um, uh, for the leading three-point non-Gaussian. Now here's a really important, remarkable point. It's uh, technically extremely simple, but is, uh, I think, conceptually totally amazing. This cosmological observables uh, observations that we're doing are at a late time. They're static. We're doing averages in space. So this thing does not seem to know anything about dynamics, anything about, uh, apart from the fact that it came from time evolution, but the actual observable is an observation you make at late times, a static measurement you make at late times, averaging over space. The incredible thing is that these cosmological correlators actually contain, mathematically inside them, they contain scattering amplitudes. They actually generalize scattering amplitudes, and they contain them in the following beautiful way. Remember, I told you, uh, so imagine any old Feynman diagram that you might want to draw that would, that would make a contribution to some cosmological correlator. Here's one. Okay, so in, in these computations, the only difference from normal computations is that there's a fixed late surface where we're doing the measurement. So there are propagators going up to this fixed late time, and so we have to put some boundary condition there that, uh, that uh, tells us that we're computing a, a cosmological correlator. Okay? 
That's how we break time translational invariance. However, all of these pieces have the usual familiar oscillatory e to the i energy times time piece of them. And therefore, there is a singularity that the correlator has, a universal singularity, when all of these time integrals go off to minus infinity together. The thing that damps that universal singularity is a phase factor that involves the sum of all the energies. So in the physical region, when we deal with the physical spatial momenta, these quote unquote energies are positive. They're just the magnitudes of the momenta. So when we add them all, we're just adding positive numbers. But analytically, we can take this function and analytically continue so that some of the energies become negative and some are positive so that the sum can add up to zero. When we sit on that locus where it's the sum of the energies now adds up to zero after we analytically continue, the wave function or the correlator uh, acquires a pole or a singularity of some sort. And the residue of that singularity is actually the flat space scattering amplitude. Okay, and that's because, that's obvious, as all these times go off the minus infinity together, that's where the singularity is coming from. But in that region, it doesn't know that there's this boundary at, at late future times. And what sits in front of it is literally the flat space scattering amplitude. So already, that's something quite exciting, that this static object that we measure in cosmology contains in it, in principle, uh, all the information that we normally think of as associated with the ordinary actual uh, uh, on-shell scattering processes via this analytic uh, continuation. Yeah, don't worry, I'm not going through the rest of the 58, 58 slides here. Yeah. Um, okay, so, 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 let's, uh, so let's, let's return to the, to the basic uh, connection between cosmology and, uh, and uh, uh, collider physics. So you can ask about the sort of non-Gaussianities that you might get from just some sort of contact interaction involving the infoton. And it's a very simple, uh, it's a very simple fact that given that this uh, contact interaction is occurring at one, uh, at one moment in time, this gives you an object in momentum space that's especially simple. Okay? It's essentially analytic. The only poles that it can have involves these sum over all these energies. And when one uh, calculated the, non the leading non-Gaussianities you get from exchanging a graviton, this also is so, something totally analytic. So order by order, uh, so, uh, if you just do the usual effective field theorist treatment of uh, physics at high energies just by integrating out particles and, uh, and including their effects by higher dimension operators, you just get something that's sort of purely analytic, order by order. So if I integrate out some heavy particle, again, that's naively what I would think. This would give me an expression that would be analytic in powers of Hubble divided by the mass of the particle to all orders. And if we were talking about a scattering process at a collider, let's say a tree level, this would be an exactly correct statement. If I look at the E plus E minus and B plus B minus scattering amplitude, the energy is low compared to the Z, it's just a polynomial. Okay, and then eventually the polynomial uh, adds up and hits a pole at the Z, but it's a dead polynomial at low energies. But this is the obvious novelty in cosmology. We don't get to control the initial state. That's bad. But on the other hand, it's a time-dependent background. It makes everything there is to be made. That's good. And in fact, there is a piece of the answer that's not captured in any order in this effective field theory expansion, which has to do with the fact that you might actually be able to pair produce particles, physical on-shell particles. Now, if you produce these physical on-shell particles, they have a characteristic oscillatory uh, behavior as a, in, in position space, simply reflecting the fact that a wave function in time goes like e to the i m t. And remember, e to the t in inflation is the scale. So there's something that goes like scale to the IT, or momentum scale to the IT. There are oscillations in, in spatial momentum. And those oscillations in spatial momentum mean that we have the following basic interference physics that's a cosmological analog of B or K meson oscillations, or the cosmological double slit experiment. Okay? The time-dependent background can actually pair produce a pair of particles. They can have two histories on one side and the other where one decays to a pair of inflatons at one time, another decays, or uh, in this case, just oscillates to an infloton on the other side. And this gives us this characteristic oscillatory pattern uh, that it becomes visible in the three-point function in the limit where two of the momenta become very large and one of them becomes small. So in the squeeze limit, the fact that you produce the particle shows up in an oscillatory pattern that's not analytic. You can't capture it by any effective field theory treatment. This is the fingerprint of there being some on-shell production of the particle. OK, and, and it shouldn't surprise you that uh, given, uh, uh, given uh, what I told you and given the, anal the analog with the particle physics, 
And part of the physics, you don't need a theorist to tell you what to expect for a cross-section when you sit on a residence. When you sit on a residence, there's a big spike, and the angular dependence is given by Legendre polynomials. Okay? So it's just a partial wave expansion. There's the analog of the partial wave expansion in cosmology that tells you exactly what should happen for the coefficient of this oscillatory piece. It's essentially entirely determined by symmetries, and here's the answer. There's an overall slow roll factor. There's a characteristic uh, exponential suppression that you would expect. If the particle is much heavier than Hubble, you should pay e to, the minus, uh, e to the minus m over Hubble. But the rest of it is entirely dictated by asymmetries. There's an oscillation um, uh, with very particular phases between the uh, two pieces. And finally, uh, the spin of the particle is encoded in a dependence on the angle here, given, as you might expect, exactly by the Legendre polynomial. Right, so this is how, by looking at non-Gaussianities, you know, distributions of galaxies in the sky, subtle patterns in the distributions of galaxies in the sky, uh, we can look for, in principle, the presence of new heavy particles near 10 to the 14 GeV. Of course, we have to be lucky. We have to be lucky that uh, the exponential suppression isn't so big. They have to be around. They have to couple to the inflaton. But it's not impossible. All right. So that's just cosmological, uh, uh, that, that's the basic connection between cosmology and collider physics. Uh, as I said, this part of the story is almost entirely determined by symmetries. It's potentially observable. Okay, so um, on the 20, 10, 20, 30 year time scale, depends on how large these interactions are. But in principle, we're eventually, hopefully going to get down to seeing the non-gaussianities that have to be there uh, uh, just uh, gravitationally. And these things, uh, there's no particular reason for the film to be much smaller than that. And if the couplings are a little larger, they might be, they might be larger as well. But this is, uh, this is a phenomenon that goes beyond the sort of usual looking for contact uh, uh, operators that we talked about. All right, so let me just uh, end. So that's the, that's the sort of basic story for, uh, for the uh, link between cosmology and the collider physics. Patterns in cosmological correlators uh, encode or whatever particles might be up there uh, 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 near, uh, near the Hubble scale during inflation. Um, and we can begin exploring this, uh, just doing computations and learning how these calculations go, and uh, trying to make predictions for experiment. Uh, but beyond that, these calculations, um, that, and this is, this is the, 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 the program I personally find kind of uh, exciting and worth thinking about on a, on a longer term, um, it, it exposes all sorts of things that we don't understand. We don't understand ab initio what the rules are for determining cosmological correlators, or said more pretentiously, what the rules are that, that determine the wave function of the universe. We don't know, for example, if you just hand me a bunch of cosmological correlators that hand me the wave function of the universe, I don't know today how to check if it's right or wrong without doing some laborious calculation of time integrals and so on and checking if it agrees with some model. But I don't know a priori what the rules are for checking whether the answer is right or wrong. This is one of the absolute deepest questions in cosmology, probably the, one of the deepest questions in fundamental physics, period, is what are the rules that determine the wave function of the universe? Now, that question, uh, given the analogy I've told you about, uh, it has a cousin on the side of scattering amplitude. What are the rules that determine the S matrix? That is also a question we don't know the answer to in the year 2019, but we have a lot more theoretical data and we've been exploring it from many points of view for a lot longer. Okay? So part of the thing that particle physics can offer cosmology in, this, uh, uh, in these beginning stages is to take all the lessons that we learned about the new ways of thinking about scattering amplitudes, eliminating the notion of virtual particles, trying to determine the answer entirely from symmetries and singularities. That's the bootstrap idea. Um, and beyond that, trying to find autonomous uh, rules and objects that, uh, that, that generate these uh, answers. This might get good. Right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually stopping. Um, so, um, uh, uh, yeah, so these, these, are, these are these sort of two different, uh, uh, these two different streams that we can explore. One is the analog of using symmetries and singularities and any tricks in the book that we can to determine cosmological correlators uh, without summing Feynman diagrams. That's the analog of the S matrix bootstrap. And there are uh, more adventurous things that we can do to, to look for new kinds of mathematical questions, new geometric structures uh, that we've already seen underlie the physics of scattering amplitudes in many cases, and beginning to look for analogs of those things in cosmology. Right. Thanks for Thank you, Nima. John Judici will go next. Uh, that's interesting. The image is still there. 
Did you did you do that? That's your correlation set. No. <laughs> so the short summary, uh, well, uh, Jean sets up is it's time for cosmology to give back. Right. And we read it in the sky. So when we, if we want to go after the fundamental uh, laws of physics, uh, those are the two domains that we have to, uh, to look. Uh, uh, from the time that it was understood that uh, thermonuclear processes uh, uh, determine how, uh, how, how a star shine, to the time today which we we think we understand the structure of the universe in terms of quantum fluctuations of a primordial field. It's uh, this whole path of connection between the small and the large, or uh, using this nice terminology of Rocky and, and, and Mike, the uh, inner space, outer space connection has always been a great source of, uh, uh, of scientific uh, discoveries. And it's clear that today the two fields are deeply uh, intertwined, and so any discovery in one field will deeply affect the, uh, the, 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 the progress in uh, the other one. So I'll uh, take the responsibility to give you a, a snapshot of what's happening in particle physics. Uh, the, uh, of course, the, uh, the leading project is the LHC. So where are we at the LHC? Uh, uh, the LHC now has completed uh, the uh, run to phase, uh, collecting 190 inverse uh, uh, femtobarn of data. And we are now in the phase in which of consolidation of the machine and preparation for the run three, which essentially, well, will go for, uh, to higher energy, depending on the performance of the magnets. So we'll reach something like 14 TV and roughly double the amount of luminosity. Then there will be the phase of preparation for the high luminosity the, the, the installations, and, uh, and then there will be the high luminosity phase, which will essentially go up by one order of magnitude in the amount of data, and bringing us to 2037, 38. Um, uh, so uh, right now, there's a lot of work going on at CERN in the type of magnet consolidation. Uh, and uh, already in the civil engineering for the preparation of the high luminosity phase, because this can be done only at the time where the beam is not running, uh, making space for the new magnets and uh, developing the magnets, the quadrupoles that are needed to squeeze the beam in order to, to get a higher luminosity, together with the upgrading of the detectors. Physics. So, of course, the Higgs boson is the centerpiece of, uh, uh, of our, 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 our activity. Uh, and this is not, it's not just being the discovery of a new particle, but really of an unprecedented phenomenon in particle physics. 
Uh, is this particle really a fundamental scalar? Uh, if it is, it brings in a, 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 a problem which is well known because uh, unlike particle with higher spin, we know the spin zero particle. For spin zero particle, the massive and massless case are, dis are described by the same number of degrees of freedom. So there's no conceptual difference between the two. So we don't understand why the Higgs should be light, and this is known as a natural this problem. Uh, uh, before the LHC, we thought that all fundamental forces were of uh, gauge type. These are the only forces that we knew. Now we are discovering some new fundamental forces which are not of the gauge type. Uh, this is uh, connected with one of the big uh, puzzles in particle physics, what gives rise to that very special pattern of quarks and lepton step that we see. Also, the simplicity of the Higgs uh, is uh, such that it's a natural portal to any kind of new sectors. Uh, the various questions that we have in particle physics are, not surprisingly, uh, uh, related to cosmology. The scalar is the Higgs, is a prototype for inflation, for uh, any kind of uh, uh, early universe space transitions, uh, connected then uh, to gravitational waves, uh, uh, the space time vacuum structure, the metastability of the standard model, therefore connected with the ultimate fate, the fate of the universe. So it is clear that uh, studying the Higgs is an experimental problem that cannot be missed because there's a lot of information uh, in it. And how you do it, you have to go through precision measurement of the Higgs uh, couplings. So where we, where we are, uh, here I'm showing a plot of the uh, particle masses, so the horizontal axis versus vertical axis, the coupling of the corresponding particle to the Higgs, and uh, as you know, in the case of the, of the uh, simple Higgs model, you should, they should all uh, line a straight line, and indeed they do. Notice that this really spans orders of magnitude, and, uh, and uh, we, have, we have measured, I mean, I, I didn't contribute, we in the sense of humanity, so we, humanity, have measured uh, gauge force on uh, uh, couplings uh, at the level of uh, below 10%, uh, and the coupling of the Higgs to the third generation quarks of lepton at uh, roughly uh, at the level of 20%. So this is now opens uh, really a new frontier of activity, of uh, precision measurement of the Higgs couplings. The goal is to go well below the percent. Just to give you an idea, that, that means a lot of uh, knowledge in terms of physics, because going below the percent in the Higgs couplings means probing the Higgs uh, substructure at the level of 10 to the minus 5, the radius of the proton. Uh, then they, 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 we want to measure the coupling of the Higgs to the second generation uh, of quarks and leptons. This is conceptually different. I mean, we are, we are puzzled by this special structure of quarks and leptons. We don't understand the generation. So going from the third generation to the second generation, which are much smaller, it can really contain something conceptually uh, different. Testing the invisible decays of the Higgs. This could be related to, to dark matter, if dark matter is coupled to the Higgs. Uh, testing the uh, Higgs self-coupling. This is related to electroweak uh, phase transition in the early universe. And then test a variety of uh, rare Higgs decays that could guide some information. So it's clear that these measurements go to the, to the very heart of the electroweak breaking sector, which is still one of the big uh, puzzles in particle physics. How can we do that? Well, there are lots of uh, projects uh, around the world to do it, uh, or proposals. Uh, one is the linear collider in Japan, one is a circular collider in China, and uh, at CERN we have a variety of projects, actually probably even too many in the sense that uh, it's unsustainable to maintain the R&D for all these projects. We need to take a decision and then we have uh, in place uh, an ongoing exercise, which is this European strategy for particle physics, and a uh, uh, decision is expected in January, and hopefully we will, uh, uh, we will define what are our uh, priorities and where we want to concentrate uh, our resources. So essentially there are two projects, two main projects on the, on the table. One is a CLIC, which is a linear collider, which will be built in stages as that advantage, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of funding, you start with uh, a tunnel of 11 kilometers, you make it longer 29, 50, 
uh, kilometers and it goes from a first phase in which the, the main goal is precision uh, physics of uh, standard model uh, particle and processes up to the level of 3 TV where you really have a discovery uh, phase. The second project is called FCC, Future Circular Collider. It's a, it's a circular tunnel of uh, about 100 kilometers and uh, uh, the plan would be to first uh, use it for any plus and minus uh, machine really of a new generation which means uh, a new uh, of new possibilities for precision measurement. Just to give you an idea, this will give, uh, will make uh, 10, to the 5, 10 to the 5 times more Z bosons than what was done during the old operation of lab. Uh, 10 to the 3 times the WW pairs of lab. So you can have uh, a million Higgs in a very clean environment like an EV plus in mind. So really, uh, this is, uh, uh, provides the best precision measurement that we can imagine for the future. And then a second stage in which the tunnel will host proton-proton, uh, 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 proton beams that do proton-proton collisions, uh, and uh, with a technology of niobium-13 uh, uh, superconducting magnets, uh, one can reach 100 TV. Uh, one could dream that by then, uh, also high temperature superconducting magnets technology has developed. In that case, you can go to say 24 Tesla, which corresponds to about 150 TeV. Uh, another possibility is that, uh, suppose that uh, some X vector is built somewhere else uh, in, uh, in the world, like in, in Asia, then a possibility would go, will be to go directly to a, a PP machine using the well-known niobium titanium uh, uh, um, uh, technique, the uh, technology, and uh, we would reach something of about uh, 40 TV. Say about, not exactly 40 TV, because 40 TV is a very ill-fated number that we don't want. <laughs> uh, uh, so when I said how to do it, uh, uh, I showed that these projects really span over decades, uh, but I didn't give you what is T0. T0 is initial time, and that will depend on what will happen in the next uh, a few years. We can try to be very optimistic and uh, design what would be the, uh, the fastest uh, possibilities, uh, a starting project soon after, at CER, soon after uh, the end of high luminosity, the high luminosity <coughs> phase, and you see that this spans to, uh, up to the end of the century. So really, the, the message from particle physics is uh, uh, keep healthy and live long if you want uh, to see the results. <laughs> uh, I, I emphasize the importance of Higgs measurement but it should be clear that the soul of high energy physics is exploration. It's always been in the past, it will, and it is now, uh, certainly. Uh, of course, one can argue, okay, but where is the new physics uh, from the LXC? At the LXC, we have not observed any technical role, comes a Klein graviton, microscopic black holes, no GUI, no nose bottom. But I'm very proud to announce that signs of stop have been observed at CERN. And I can show you a proof because I took a picture of it uh, just outside my <laughs> office. I suspect that these are not the kind, the kind of uh, signs of stop that the LHC was looking for, but more seriously, there are some, uh, some strange, uh, 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 some anomalous uh, results in some rare uh, a rare BDKs, which are very interesting place where, where new physics uh, could hide. The results at the moment are inconclusive. It's interesting to notice that the value of sigmas that are here are about, I would say, as much as H naught, meaning that nobody knows how many sigmas there are. Uh, okay, so. So does that mean that uh, since we haven't discovered uh, new particles that the LHC has given no information to us? On the contrary, I would really say that uh, the LHC has radically affected already the way we think. Although not in the way it was expected. 
Uh, so if I can use a metaphor, see the, the, the physics before the LXC was like we had some mountains far away, we knew they were there, and the road it was a clear road to follow how to get there, increase the energy, you're going to reach those mountains and then explore them. Well, I would say that the situation right now is more like that, in which uh, we have uh, a variety of possibilities and we don't, we don't know which one is the right road and where it leads. Now, if I can make a comparison, see the first picture uh, gives a much more favorable, uh, it's much more favorable for a long-term uh, planning of experiments. And it's exciting for experimentalists because they know what are the goals, what you have to do. I would say as a theorist that's also it's more dull because the main preoccupation is essentially measuring some parameters. Take the second picture, of course, it's much more risky and uncertain. Uh, and experimentalists in this case need to be more creative because they have to find uh, uh, the way to proceed. From the point of view of theory, it's a lot more exciting because now the main preoccupation is to think about fundamental questions. So uh, the fundamental questions were known before. It's not that has, has changed, but now what is changing is really the way we are addressing. It's too early uh, to tell what's ahead, and uh, I will just uh, give uh, two quick examples. Another beautiful example has been given uh, by Nima before. Uh, one, Higgs naturalness. Uh, since I heard the, the conference often was used this word natural, I mean, in this context, the word natural for a theory does not mean that the theory is uh, pretty and cute. It really has a well defined <coughs> mathematical meaning in the context of quantum field theory. And uh, uh, we were driven, uh, the LHC was driven by this concept in the search for a, for a weak scale explanation of it. Uh, now there is a, uh, uh, this starting new ideas in trying to address this problem, not using physics at the weak scale, but using cosmological evolution. I, I won't have the time to go through uh, the various models. Uh, they have common features and they have distinguishing features, especially in the way uh, that the selection of the electroweak vacuum occurs. It could be some dynamical selection, like say the, the relaxing, which really is the dynamics that, re, that drives the Higgs in the right place. It could be some kind of statistical selection, and yet Valley has worked on that in the sense that the, the right electroweak vacuum is just much more likely than anything else, sort of uh, in terms of entropy is preferred, or it could be some censorship. Uh, um, and uh, like, uh, uh, it, could be, it could be a pure and anthropic argument, so it could be a more sophisticated argument, and naturalness is an example. Now, uh, I, I should say that uh, I don't find that any of the proposals is necessarily compelling, and I can afford of saying because I'm also I've also contributed with one example. But I think it just uh, shows that the way that we are looking towards uh, different directions. They, if we want to look for common denominators of the various approach, I would say there are two features. One is that some form of multiverse is really always existing because you are playing with scanning parameters. The, the second feature is that in the, uh, in the traditional way of addressing naturalness, the problem of cosmological constant was somehow decoupled, was thinking something else. In this case, in which you are scanning something that also contributes to the vacuum energy, it's, in, it's nearly impossible to decouple the two things. So we're really seeing that the cosmological constant problem and the Higgs problem come at the same time. Uh, we are challenging the role of symmetry. Symmetry before, before the LXC was always regarded somehow as a guiding principle for constructing new theories. Now Hiroshi uh, explained uh, this conference uh, why global symmetries are not compatible, or at least appear not to be compatible with quantum gravity. Well, we're left with gauge symmetries. Uh, we know they're not real symmetry in the physical sense. They're just a redundancy of your, of your description. So symmetry, rather than being a government principle, may just, uh, it's much more likely to be only some emergent property, but we need then to find something else, which is the guiding principle for constructing new theory. The last 
element is the swampland, uh, the swampland will see that uh, many of the theories that from the IR point of view seem plausible, consistent with, with the symmetry, do not have a consistent uh, UV completion. And that changes the rule of the game. And in particular, it challenges the effective field theory intuition. And remember that natural and technological constant problems are based on effective field theory uh, intuition. So there is a possibility for new ideas. I have a second example that I will skip in the interest of time. So let me get uh, uh, towards the end. I just want to make one remark, and then I close. Uh, very often now that we talk about the future, I hear people asking, so what shall we do for the future? Should we build a, a telescope, or should we do interferometer and go for gravitational waves? Shall we build uh, high energy colliders, or is really the only way to make uh, progress is to think and go with uh, theoretical physics? For me, this kind of question is uh, just the wrong question. Uh, when we do fundamental physics, we are driven by exploration. And uh, it was always uh, true, and is even truer today, is that we need a diversified approach in order to address the fundamental questions that we have ahead. So when we judge a, a project, uh, what's important for me is the knowledge that is acquired from the result of that project. Uh, knowledge, uh, Knowledge should be knowledge about fundamental uh, questions and also knowledge that cannot be addressed by other, uh, with, uh, with other tools. And uh, I will conclude with a, with a quote in defense of uh, what I advocate of, uh, in defense of uh, fundamental research. And the quote is not from the latest uh, uh, Nobel Prize or from a great uh, theoretical physicist, but it's from a medieval monk. And when he was criticized for his interest in understanding the universe, he gave a very forceful and dignified defense of fundamental science. And he quote, if we turned our backs on the amazing rational beauty of the universe we live in, we should indeed deserve to be ridden therefrom, like a guest and appreciative of the house into which he has been received. Thank you. Some of these 
uh, string theoretical constructions, for example, can be quite um, cumbersome, and sometimes it's nice to just focus it, zone in on little pieces of it that you can understand in detail. Um, and of course, what's the role of observational cosmology? I think that goes without saying, but we're measuring things and testing models is one way of looking at it. And sometimes finding new phenomena no one has thought about. So how can this be controversial? It seems pretty compatible to me. Um, so the only controversy really happens when somebody, uh, we won't name who, um, are too insistent they know something before it's measured. And then, um, and then it leads into trouble. And you know, it's amazing how many, I, I mean, we were having a conversation earlier, I think with Saul and other people. You know, it's amazing how many times people think they know everything and then are surprised, even though this happens every time. So almost all the interesting things, dark matter, dark energy, even, even more detailed particle things, like positron excess from Pamela, which people were looking for dark matter, but still, or thinking about dark matter, but also thinking about just cosmology, um, GV excess from Fermi. All of these things are surprises, but I mean, it seems to me that every time we have a new machine, we get surprises, so why are we surprised? Okay. So, the other controversy is then, is um, sometimes, and I have to admit, I've encountered this sometimes in the astrophysical community, probably more than particles in the community, when people are like, the standard model works, so why, we don't need anything else. And generally, that's true at any given stage of physics. We know what we know, and we've tested it, and we've tried to, have, but we're looking at the edge. We're looking for what we're missing. And often, those are small clues. And the way you find small clues is you measure and put limits or discover what's allowed. And so I'm just gonna go through a few examples of things I've worked on where I've encountered sort of this attitude a little bit, um, but, but also we've learned new things. So this is the list and I'll just go through them. And I just, before I mention though, I just wanna say that that same thing applies in theory, which is things like, you know, um, there's statements that are often made like infinite dimension was forbidden, and then we, um, from Sundrum, we had a model that defied this. And it was actually very interesting to see how the model defined what, what seemed to be a theorem. And so I think that particle physics plays a role not just in um, finding, finding new phenomena or ways to find new phenomena in um, experiment, but sometimes also in theory, when you have little models that you do. And right now I'm, I'm thinking about the question of whether we actually have um, KKL2 vacua, and I won't have time to talk about that, but it really is kind of a funny question. Do we have 10 to the 500 vacua, or do we have zero? Oh. <laughs> so, so this is kind of obnoxious, but in the spirit of Mark Davis's talks last night, I can just say the phys particle physicist mantra is a little bit, I told you so. Um, in the sense that um, things are worth investigating. It's, it's silly to just say there's no reason to look for it, especially if you have measurements, observations out there that are looking for things anyway. So if things are not, even um, if things are not ruled out, we can always learn something by doing your measurements and putting them on, whether we discover something or not, and sometimes we do. Um, and so I just want to be really clear, and not all models are right, and in fact, I would say very few are. Um, you know, when I talk to friends outside of physics, and they say, what are you working on? And, and, and when I tell them I think it's unlikely to be correct, they're really shocked. But that's how we know. <laughs> very few people get it right the first time. Um, but we still learn a lot. Okay. So the first example I just want to mention, so I'm just mentioning things we're actually going into detail and looking at the details change the sort of way we looked at things. Um, so one of them was darkly charged dark matter. This actually isn't the darkness. This is just saying that all the dark matter is charged under its own force. And um, people, it, it seemed to be relatively unexplored. Um, and one of the reasons it just seemed, even though it's not charged under our electromagnetism, it was charged under any electromagnetism, it was thought to be unlikely. It would change the structure of halos. I'm going through things quickly. I'm obviously not going to have time to just detail. Um, all the cluster measurements would seem to disagree. Um, there's an interesting constraint about survival of dwarf galaxies if you have interacting dark matter because it has to go through the halo. Um, so it seemed to significantly impinge on parameter space. But it turns out there were many incorrect assumptions or overly um, optimistic assumptions and analyses. And with some um, postdocs and colleagues, um, we explored these assumptions and we just started with a more general model builder attitude. And we, it, it turns out there's, that there's a really pretty big allowed parameter space. You can basically have um, dark matter that's or order TV scale that's charged under um, something that's basically as strong as electro electromagnetism, and it's not there, it's full out. So that could really change um, what things look like in the universe. And the fact that we haven't seen evidence for it is precisely a reasonable look. And the fact that it almost looks constrained means that if we understand it better, we can get um, constraints. So I, th I think this is a really interesting direction going by looking at structure and how it impinges on charged dark, self-charged dark matter. Um, another
a related example is that not only matter interacts, but only a fraction interacts. And we call that partially interacting dark matter and also dark, double disk dark matter for reasons that will be clear. So rather than assume all the dark matter is charged, maybe it's only a fraction. After all, our universe is somewhat complicated. We have a real zoo of particles. Why do we assume that dark matter is so simple? It's kind of a little bit arrogant. Um, so a fraction, though, changes all the constraints. The conventional constraints are obviously weak, um, for reasons that are obvious, I'm not going to go through them. But it's lots of important implications for measurements. And in particular, one of the really interesting possibilities is that there is a dark charged particle that's charged that's about the mass of an electron, somewhere around there. And then it can cool to form it to actually form a disk, just the way the Milky Way disks form, by electrons allowing for cooling. You need a light particle for that to happen. Um, you need to radiate and cool, and it's a disk because they have momentum to conserve. And um, so the simplest option to get such a thing would be something like darkly charged dark matter, where only a fraction here is charged. And um, there, um, again, when we did this, we were actually literally told this was not allowed. Um, in fact, it is said in the paper. And, and now, if you think about that, that's a statement you should really very rarely make, because obviously there's always just a bound. Uh, to say something is not allowed is, it has to be an overstatement. But in this case, the constraints, even on the parameter range we were really focusing on, were too strong. And that um, part of the reason is that to put balance in this case, you have to really do it self consistently. We're talking about gravity. If you don't put in the disk in the beginning, you get the distributions of other components wrong. There's a lot of details, and I don't have time to go into them. But it turns, and, and one of the really interesting things, and this was with um, the then student, Eric Kramer, is that the, uh, the tracer populations were actually not in equilibrium. And I think that's still an issue when we analyze the data. Because there should be a kind of, there's a kind of constraint you can put on the total amount of matter, but you have to know it's in equilibrium. If you don't know it's in equilibrium, it's, it's much more clear, I would say. So, um, so you kind of dissipate a fraction, it generates structure, and I'm not going to talk about it. And the one thing I really do want to emphasize, and this has come up again and again, um, you know, ba way back in the day when I was um, doing CP violation of particle physics, I worked on something called epsilon prime over epsilon. It's a CP, vi a CP violating parameter. And if you look at that story, it's a really interesting story. Because repeatedly, uh, theorists would say, if we predict epsilon prime over epsilon will be this. And experimenters diligently went ahead and found and made the measurement, and they didn't find it. And then the theorists would say, oh, well, we made this assumption. So I think when we're telling um, observers that, we're gonna, that something is ruled out, we should really make sure that it's ruled out, and that it's not just something that's buried in some assumption that we're, they're making. In other words, if they were to find it, would we just say, oh, yeah, we made this assumption wrong, well, sorry. So we should really think about what we mean when we, when we say this. Um, so the general lesson of all of this is there's a role for particle physics and astronomy. Um, constraint on the dark get this came from fitting very standard components, and there were errors in those components that had to account for. It has to be done self consistently. You have big, messy data sets, and it helps. The other thing that we learned by actually doing the dark disk was there's independent parameters. There's sort of the surface density in the disk, and there's the height of the disk, which were just treated as some extra component of an existing thing. So it wasn't given as an independent parameter. So it gives you a better idea of how you want to constrain your parameter space. So targeting a model. So the next example I'm going to do, and I'm really racing, um, but so I want to talk about wimpish dark matter. Um, this is work uh, done with the student Linda Boom is here. Um, but so I just want to say that you know we're sort of at the point where a lot of people are like, oh well, wimps don't work. I mean, to be honest, I was never the biggest fan of wimps. I thought they're one possibility, but we have no evidence for it. So you know we should consider along with others, and I'd still say that's true. Um, but so far we have negative results. But wimps are based on thermal relic density, um, and that part's still compelling. But of course, they're very constrained. It was directly interacting with the standard model from part from experiments like the one that Lane is doing. So, um, so what's a viable option that would just, in one fell swoop, get around these constraints and um, unfortunately be less interesting for the dark detection in the future? <coughs> there is a possibility that this cross section is the same, the dark matter and I to other dark particles, other hidden particles. And those, in turn, can, not, can um, turn into, so it says annihilate, could turn into a standard model. And perhaps dark gauge fields are the most promising. And so what we did is we actually looked at anti-deuteron searches, which covers a parameter regime that um, wouldn't have been covered otherwise. So um, there's, um, it relies on indirect detection, which is one of the three pillars of web searches. Um, so you can look for antiparticles or photons that are indicative of some particular type of exotic thing in the universe. Now, why anti-deuterons? Of course, the production cross-section for that is ridiculously tiny. But the interesting thing is the background is also really low. It's molecular kinetic energy. 
um, just because you need so many um, um, like nucleons to, to form it. So it makes it essentially background-free measurement, and so only a few uh, detections can suffice for discovery. And in fact, there's something called GAPS, which will um, launch uh, allegedly end of 2020, but probably 2021, which is a long-duration balloon experiment. Um, Anti-deuterons are captured and result in exotic atoms in the final state, and they decay, and uh, I'll let you read up it. It's a really cool, very, very clever experiment. Um, the problem is, this slide was from um, 10 years ago, and so, <laughs> So um, at the time, they thought they were going to launch in 2014. But they didn't launch, and now they're going to launch now. So we had the question of what they were going to see. And what's really, given how much we've learned from direct detection, and again, this is a place where I do think model building is, plays a big role, and the answer is, of course, the hidden dark matter, dark photon. And so this can study, you know, in, in an interesting regime, and as yet unsworn, a lot of the searches for this hidden dark matter has been from very light um, hidden dark matter. So this is really interesting. And um, just flashing the result, which is that saying that basically over the interesting parameter range, there's a good chance that um, gaps can see it. Um, AMS, could, in principle, has seen it, but this is based on its original magnet, and they haven't actually told us their sensitivities with how they're currently operating. But gaps really has a chance of seeing something, which is really interesting. So, um, and so, Again, model builder view of WIMPs, uh, original models are definitely a stretch now to make them work. I mean, people are still looking, they might work. Could be some very exotic version of some uh, standard model like thing. But it doesn't rule out thermal relic abundance, and it's worth seeing ways to test these ideas. And one of the really interesting things is that um, uh, James Owen, a collaborator, showed that it could potentially explain, this kind of dark matter could potentially explain the GEV excess, and um, if it's true, we'll be able to test it with anti neutron searches. Okay, third example. Um, this is some work that I've done with um, Shangji Han Yu, also here. Um, but basically looking at uh, eccentricity in binary black holes. So we, when they first measured gravitational waves, of course, we were all very excited. Um, but of course, as particle physicists, we're all like, so what are we going to learn? So of course, we'll learn some astrophysics, we'll learn about black holes, but we want to see like what we can learn about the environment that they come from. And of course, I have very optimistic ideas of what you can learn in the beginning, you know, learn about dark matter, et cetera. But then we realized we actually really don't know where they're from. Are they from the center of the galaxy? Are they from the really cluster image? Are they from out in the field? So we thought, well, maybe that's a question that could be answered. So we thought one way that would, could be interesting for distinguishing this was eccentricity of, of the events. So are there tidal forces that affect the orbit, the in spiral orbit? And um, at the time, people just talked about spin as a way of identifying it. And, um, and, and they concluded the idea of, of thinking about eccentricity. They said, we're not going to measure eccentricity. So right now we have very rigorous <coughs> measurements on spin, and so a lot of people are a lot more interested in this. I'm just saying, five minutes, okay. Well, so it turns out that you can get um, observable effects, and um, and the reason you want to do this is because first of all, you don't want to miss what's in the data, and second of all, um, it could be that you have phase shifts that you're incorrectly inter interpreting to the parameters you've included. You know, you'd like. To, I think a lot of the time we want to turn a blind eye to the possibility of these extra parameters. But they actually affect how you interpret your results, and that's important. And so we've done a lot of work on this. We've done many different things and shows. There are many possible measurements. LIGO, it will be hard, but they might be able to see something. Um, but there's other effects, especially when we have LISA. Um, there's going to be Doppler shifts that are measurable, potentially even seeing direct COSA-LIGO, which is a three-body effect I can talk about. And um, the, the latest paper we did, which is kind of fun, which is to say that you can even tell this eccentricity without even measuring it, because you would see such a difference in the Expected population um, between LIGO and ESA. So that's really fun. Okay. So the last example is more theoretical, and um, since I don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to mention it. But I will say this is um, think about the question of whether you can get to serve space from higher dimensions. And this is a question the string theorists have been addressing, but you know, we just want to see what's going on. Why is this so far? Um, there's at least two big challenges. One is to stabilize the extra dimensions. If you have extra dimensions, you want to have four dimensions that have lots of dynamics, but the other dimensions have to be stationary, or otherwise M Planck is going to change. And, um, but you also want to include energy and lowering theory so that higher dimensions don't move the lower dimensions strip, which is what I just said. So at David Pinner, we just looked at the second possibility and just said, what's going on? So, um, so we just looked at very simple examples. So we really just followed our notes. And some of this follows work that's already in the literature, but we just did it for ourselves because we're model builders, and that's what we did. Okay. So, the first thing we did is we just said, well, what happens? You would just have a simple factorizable metric, 
and just see what happens. And it turns out that the energy momentum tensor that you need to get what, what we want, and remember, all we want is we have four dimensions with dynamics and Hubble parameters, say, to sitter, we want six dimensions that are stationary. It's up before that you, it's really hard to get from usual matter. It's not of the form of an ordinary cosmological constant plus another ordinary cosmological constant plus another. Um, so you can pair it with something, but what you'd have to pair it with looks like it implies negative energy, which is the, you know, the fundamental stumbling block that people are getting into when they try to find a sitter. And you see it just really simply just by plugging it and working it out you see, at this level. So you can say, okay, what is the space's curve? That was really simple what we just did. Let's have a curve, we just have flat space, let's have a curve space. And then it looks promising, because you can actually get the extra thing with curvature, um, because curvature is something that doesn't involve the T00 component, which is probably what makes it possible to solve it. But it turns out this is unstable. So it looks like there's a solution, but if you didn't stabilize it, you're going to run into trouble. So that's, again, the kind of question, thing that people have realized. If you don't stabilize that sphere, you're going to run into trouble. OK, so let's try a slightly more complicated example. Let's allow warping. So we'll allow the coefficient to depend on some extra coordinate y. So, so, so we'll have one extra dimension, we'll call it y. And then we just literally you know, fall out our noses. We said we don't want to have off-diagonal elements. We want to make sure that the entry momentum tensor is of that funny form that I gave you in the beginning. And it turns out that you can get that. It turns out that h of y has to be constant. The time part has to be the proportional spatial part. And guess what you get? Well, you can't, probably can't read this. But it turns out that the only solution you get of this form turns out to be anti-desitter space sliced by desitter. So in other words, it's exactly like an RS model of, which, with a warped um, extra dimension, but it's sliced by desitter. So of course, in this case, you're sort of cheating, but it works because you get, you really have a negative cosmological constant overall, but you can still have boundary conditions that give you desitter space. So that's one way that you can get around it and find that you actually have um, positive energy and still be consistent with whatever energy momentum tends you need without having to have funny components. And of course, in this case, the challenge is um, what's, what establishes the boundary conditions but we were amused by this. Okay, then um, we said, okay, well, can we do, can we do better? Can we do this with, with more dimensions? So we take the product with the sphere, and it turns out that if you did that, it would work, except you need negative curvature. So again, it's really interesting just to see how these um, little problems translate into very specific little problems in simple toy models. Um, so, <laughs> then of course, there are string constructions, and I don't have time to go into it now, um, but I will be talking at the University of Chicago at 3 about some work in progress. <coughs> but you see, I mean, what, well, what this is telling you is that you can't necessarily just add the energy so simply. And we know this from the study of warp, the warp geometry. I mean, you might have said naively that you had a negative cosmological constant, but of course, what really matters is what you see from your four dimensional perspective. And that's the, basically the kind of thing that's going to show up. So, back to controversy. Um, so, I just want to just have one study about commenting on desider from string theory. Which is, I think it is too soon, though, to say that we have a landscape or a swampland. Because, yes, um, um, KKLT generally, definitely gen could generate, or I think can generate, a stable anti desitter. It's not clear desitter is stable. But that just means you need uplift energy. And so I disagree that it's clearly impossible. Because, I mean, this construction so far rely on explicit UV ingredients. And they wouldn't even generate the standard model. So it seems to me that you, know, you want to think harder about what are the subtle things that will give you the standard model. And maybe if you had a stable Higgs potential, you can also figure out a way to get stable up with energy. So these are all based on relatively stable construction. I mean, they seem complicated, but we still don't have the complications necessary to get the physics we know is there. So I think it's too soon to um, declare what we think is right or not right. So to conclude, lots of debates. As physicists, um, sometimes it's you know, sh uh, shut up and calculate, but I thought sit down and calculate because I like to talk to people. So, but as model builders, we also say sit down and speculate. Um, but then, of course, we sit down and calculate and repeat. So, thank you. Okay. Um, the panelists have given us a lot to think about. Um, and let me try to summarize what I think I learned in one sentence from each one. So, so Nima told us it's time for cosmology to get back. And maybe one way to do it is uh, to read scattering amplitudes on the sky. Uh, John told us that particle physics and cosmology are tied at the hip. And uh, accelerators are needed to explore. And if we stop exploring, we lose our souls. Is that that last quote? 
<laughs> and, uh, oh boy, I hate to summarize, Lisa, turn your microphone off. Uh, she told us to be humble about what we don't know, challenge conventional wisdom, um, and it's the uh, unknown unknowns and the surprises uh, uh, that will be big. But now we have to figure out uh, where to go from here. So I'll ask the panelists a few questions. And then uh, we have plenty of time to open it up to the audiences. audience. So here's a question, and any panelist, it would be great if you each gave one answer to this. I know that won't happen. Um, uh, so what's number one on your list for cosmologists to give back to particle physicists? And if you don't respond, that's okay. I got a bunch of other questions. For me, a cosmological constant. To know if it is really a, a cosmological constant or something else, that will have a big impact. The second one is. is, is well, you just get one. <laughs> <laughs> you just get one. You got to get back at the end of the line. Uh, those Italians, they're always trying to do that. <laughs> okay, Lisa, did you have one? Um, I'd really like to see dark matter uh, structure explored on small scales. So um, I'd like to really see how small we can get, because a lot of the time if you're interacting dark matter or interested in dark matter, you really see the differences on scales that are less than what we've so far been able to explore. So I think if we can do that, we will learn a lot. And you've got your microphone on. Yes, did everyone hear that? Risa, did you hear that? I so, heard it. Does, is that, oh, that's why I see that beautiful smile on your face. <laughs> you got someone, okay, good. Uh, Nima, did you wanna? Well, given that uh, the, that you don't you, have to. Well, I, I would say what, what uh, uh, the last thing that was not said that, that John wanted to say uh, are. Uh, I think if we get some, some, You're cheating. Uh, some access. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and maybe, uh, uh, and it's not actually unrelated to what I was talking about because uh, uh, all of these uh, potential non Gaussianities that might give us information about incredibly high energy physics, there was a sort of slow roll factor that was sitting in front of that entire damn expression. So if we don't have very high scale inflation, um, likely to see R, maybe first, or at least simultaneously, very likely first, we're unlikely to get access to any of this uh, uh, other stuff. So at the zeroth order would be just spectacular. So we need to see R first, and then, then we can go for the I don't know if that's a theorem, because you could probably, you know, there are probably corners and parameter space where that's not true, but morally it's true. You need okay. high scale inflation. <laughs> so I, I don't know if John Carlstrom is here, but that should put a smile on his face. That's the, Another reason to see our. Um, you politely got to the back of the line, John. So if you have no, a just, second. Just the, well, he stole the second. But, uh, well, but no repeating. One comment, no, I'm not repeating. Uh, just one comment. The fact that we have so many and uh, we are trying to even squeeze more than one answer while you were strictly asked for only one, it shows that essentially we really hungry as particle physics, we're really hungry for information and essentially all of it, it will have an impact. It's uh, really, uh, today it's impossible that one uh, important breakthrough in cosmology will not have a direct impact in particle physics and I would say vice versa. Okay, I'm going to add something else. Yeah, that is very quotable. Um, I, I think this is focusing more on the cosmology things. Again, this is sort of a structure thing, but it's related to what I said, but I think studying dwarf galaxies more. Um, could be a really interesting thing to do. First of all, they have probably have more dark matter in them. Second of all, if there are these uh, structure effects, they're going to show up more in four galaxies. And I think we're really overlooking an opportunity there because there are some that are accessible. Lisa is glowing. Uh, Lisa is glowing so brightly that uh, we got to go on to the next. Uh, Actually, I have one very, very quick thing. Uh, <laughs> there's a, there's a perception out there that uh, that wimps are somehow dead or pushed and pushed into funny corners. I totally disagree with that. The very, very simplest models of WIMPs, the dead, dumbest, simplest models of WIMPs, like an electric triplet or an electric doublet, these are perfectly alive and well. They're the same models that they have been, ever been since the year 1980. It's not theorists moving the goalposts or changing the rules. It just so happens that those very, very simplest models have doublets at 1 TeV or triplets at 3 TeV with tiny direct detection cross sections approaching the, the neutrino floor. So in some cases, that could be uh, Floor. So, um, uh, I would be I would be uh, very gratified if uh, if uh, the people looking 
for WIMPs could assure us that the, if there's a triplet out there with the cross section down near the uh, digital floor, that, 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 that eventually they'll find it. So it's not, it's not like the, the theories are running away and we're only going to slivers of parameter space of things that are fine tuned and crazy. In fact, the dead simplest models of WIMPs are alive and well. Um, and, uh, <coughs> be, and they, we should keep looking for them. Yeah, so that makes Elaine very happy. Let me move on to the, the next one. So um, I'm imagining, uh, you know, an, an astronomer or an astrophysicist out there, um, and they've been very loyal and come to all these talks, and oh my god, they hear it's hard to sort out the, the free-range speculation of some of the theories. And so if you had one thing that you would want uh, an astronomer in particular, a cosmologist, uh, who's not an expert on particle physics, um, you wanted to give them one piece of advice in thinking about how to move forward, whether it would be an observation or, or model building, you know, what, what, what should they take, what, what would be an important piece of advice to make uh, progress in cosmology, either an experiment or, uh, you know, here's a theoretical idea that's underexplored and it may solve your problems. And, and again, if you don't bite on this, I got plenty of questions. Anyone want to bite on that? I, I would just say again what I said earlier, which is that think of measurements not just as measuring parameters that you're sure are there, but thinking of what kind of constraints you can put on other on other models. Um, it, 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 it complicates it's a little more tricky, but in the, in the long run, that's how we know we're going to have more information. Anybody else want to? I mean, I would say at zero order experimental issue, ignore theorists. At zero order. Maybe even in, at minus one order. Uh, at minus one order, they should ignore theorists and just uh, pursue whatever the phenomena that are important. So, you know, for, for, for years after the accelerating universe, all kinds of distinguished august theorists say, oh, now we know the cosmos of concept W equals minus one. Yeah, I'm going to But it's a fantastic idea to ignore uh, when everyone is certain and just go measure the crazy new phenomena that you've discovered. Measure the hell out of it. That's the zero order thing, um, or the minus one order thing. But I'd say the zero order thing is that it would be good to have. Uh, How many uh, orders are you going? Well, no. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it, it, I mean, it, it's a trivial comment, and I don't think it, I think that, uh, to this extent things are pretty healthy in, uh, in uh, astrophysics. So, so you But but there's an experiment also that actually talk informally much more often. So it should not be uh, you know. Uh, just a whole uh, collection of models that are sitting there monolithically waiting to be probed and perhaps. So like they do a comedy right. institute. Right. So. Perhaps, yeah. Okay, good. Can, um, I, can I also? I, yeah. I, I agree on the order one answer. I disagree on the order zero. Maybe because I'm coming from... from We're not allowing you go back to the minus one. The poll is... is I, you know, that experimentalists should ignore theories. Uh, I think, maybe because I'm coming from a lab, so I have uh, uh, a lot of interaction with experimentalists, uh, it's, uh, it's, for me it's even a dangerous uh, message to pass. Uh, it's, uh, the guidance from theory doesn't mean, oh, I'll give you the model, you should check if the model is right or wrong, but at the level of strategy. And the role that theory plays in the strategical sense for saying what is important, where are we going to get knowledge, where an experiment, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, one, one can do it, uh, but uh, we, don't, we don't address good question. I'm not saying, you know, if the result will be positive or negative. That no theorist can say. But the theorist can say what kind of knowledge can be extracted from an experiment. And that kind of con constant interaction and participation of theorists in deciding where to go, for me, it's absolutely crucial. Cool. Okay, I'll amend what I said. Ignore mediocre theorists. <laughs> 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 respect for theorists. Um, one, uh, let me go to one other one here, and then I'll let the panel ask each other questions. I just want to say one thing. Yeah. This, this, I, think, I just want to reiterate that point, because I think it's especially true in the era of these big, messy data sets. It's just very hard to pick things out. So it really helps to helps to have targets, and it, and that way you can actually put constraints in very clean ways that are useful for the future. I'm, I'm glad that someone from Harvard says that, and not someone from a lab, uh, because you know I, the, after the result of the NFC, I hear experimentally say, oh, you see those dummy theorists told us that we had to discover supersymmetry. Now we should not listen to that because the next step. 
Well, that is, that is, I think it will be really, really, that is a dummy part of uh, proceeding uh, and going ahead uh, without knowing why you're doing it. So it's, it should be a constant interplay between theorists and experimenters. I'm not saying that theorists have the knowledge and the right to... Uh, so well, so we, got to that, we got that answer. We need to respect theorists more. And then Dima said we need free-range experimentalists just like we have free-range theorists. So I was, I was uh, fascinated by Lisa's remark about conventional wisdom, that uh, conventional wisdom is often wrong, and when you challenge it, uh, good things happen. So I remember Saul Perlmutter being told that it was well known that you could not uh, subtract CCD images. You could not align them well enough to, to find supernova, and he asked for the paper. Saul being stupid said, well, I can't find the paper, I better just try to do this. So what bit of conventional wisdom would you, is a good one, uh, is a prime one to ignore? And again, if you don't bite on this question, we've got the audience to give you some more questions. So what, where is the conventional wisdom suspect, or what, what's the next rock we might turn over? Well, I'd say something theoretical. I think there's a, there is a conventional wisdom um, that we understand uh, that we have a very good understanding in theoretical physics of what we know and what we don't know, as codified in Wilson's picture of effective field theory. So this is a huge advance over you know 50 years ago. Even we know what we know, an usual picture of things. We know what we know. Um, we know physics up to the TV scale. But we know physics at very long distances. We know what we don't know. Oh, something happens, uh, maybe up, up, up the Planck scale eventually, there's something funny going on with gravity and so on. But we, have, we think we have a very good idea of, this, uh, of the demarcation line. So roughly speaking, everything but the Planck scale is understood, classic standard uh, local quantum field theory, standard rules, and so on. Um, and maybe uh, up at energies above the, uh, the Planck scale, they're, they're, they're demonstrated. We've no, also known for a long time, though, there's something... Somewhere in this answer, you have yeah. to work in the words conventional wisdom. Well, that, that's the conventional wisdom, is that we think we understand okay. the things that we know and the things that we don't know. But we've also had hints for a very long time there's something essentially different about gravity, that uh, the entire reductionist paradigm that goes into our picture of local uh, quantum field theory uh, breaks down when you have gravity. The physics of very, very high energy starts turning to very, very large distance. We get all kinds of echoes of this all over the place in our understanding of quantum gravity. We also have direct evidence from experiments that, that the basic underpinning of our expectation about the way the world works, uh, of the Wilsonian worldview that would lead us to expect that humans couldn't be lonely, we should have all sorts of other things going along with it, that we shouldn't, uh, the cosmological constant should be much bigger than it is, and so on. Um, that even experimental indications are something wrong with this worldview. So I think it's, it's quite possible that uh, when we understand things a lot better in 100 years, we'll look back and just as people realized that when the electron was going around the nucleus of the atom, there was actually nothing breaking down in the structure of classical physics then, right? It's not like there was the classical electrodynamics was like breaking down. It was just wrong because quantum mechanics showed up in a place you wouldn't expect anything to break down. Maybe you'd expect something to break down the, when the electron was up in the nucleus of the atom, uh, where there's a singularity, but far away where everything was fine in classical physics, the, the right theory reared its head and, and made something different happen. Um, I, I, I'm not totally confident of this, but I think it's, uh, it's entirely possible that, that our, our, our understanding of, of what we know and what we don't know is, is, is going to be seen as essentially different. Uh, and all these questions that we face about the cosmological constant, about the hierarchy problem, as well as deep mysteries about the emergence of space-time and quantum gravity and so on, will, will be seen to be much more closely connected than we think they are now. Great. Uh, ending. I have a much more um, banal Good. Let's go for banal. Which is that I think it's, I wouldn't say it's really conventional wisdom, but I think it's a conventional misunderstanding that once you do, de if you do, even under the Wilsonian approach, once you do determine the UV theory, the high energy stuff, that everything is determined. And um, I think all of us know that there's lots of things that can happen on the way from going to the high energy to the low energy. And that's often forgotten. And so there's often conclusions that are come this can't happen at low energy, this can't happen, which um, just can be violated by having additional ingredients that have and so there's this idea that's, you know, especially, you know, either like structural modular effects and nothing can happen after that. But I don't think that's so true. Great. Um, let's open it up to the audience. I was, before we do, I, I was just reminded by something really interesting that uh, Lisa said. Uh, she talked about no-go theorems. 
And uh, my, uh, over my career, it seems to me the purpose of no-go theorems is to challenge theorists to work on really hard problems. And every no-go theorem has produced a workaround that was extremely interesting. And you, you mentioned the large extra dimensions, but there are other, other examples. So uh, audience, it's your turn for questions. For the for our distinguished panel, we have a very shy audience. Uh, <laughs> I think everybody's burning with questions. So I, I thought um, I loved um, Nima's last remark, and um, so it's, it's actually a simple question: What's actionable about that? So I don't think you can answer. Wait. So to expand a little bit, so you cited quantum mechanics as an example of this transformative change in thinking in the laws of nature. Um, the similar transformative experiment on you know, holographic effects, you know, on macroscopic scales or any of these other things, won't be answered by the, the huge colliders, probably. You have to do some. So what would you do? What's the actionable experiment? I don't know. Um, I, I can't say anything about an actionable experiment yet, because uh, um, uh, going sort of against what I was saying before, and more along the lines of what John was sort of saying, uh, uh, you need to know enough about what the or Zot's theoretical structure is properly to be able to talk about what, what, what a real experimental test might be. You do, one can do fishing expeditions uh, no matter what. But what I would say, there is something actionable that one can do theoretically. Um, and uh, that's uh, along the lines of the, the, the part of my talk that I, that I really didn't talk about. But <coughs> certainly what many of my friends and I have been doing for the last 10 years, and other people have been doing for 20 or 30 years. If there really is a, if there is a similar <coughs> leap as radical, the leap from classical to quantum in our future, then it's very unlikely that it's going to leave <coughs> our usual way of thinking about physics, um, while totally correct, um, uh, um, also completely unchanged. And if you think about uh, what you would do, I'd like to imagine um, going back to a theoretical physicist in 1850, waking them up in the, in the middle of the night. The ghost of theorist future comes and wakes them up in the middle of the night and says, I have news for you from 1930. Determinism is gone, phew, and they, you know, they disappear into the night as ghosts of theorists future want to do. Uh, and, uh, well, but no, this is 1850, right? So, so just uh, this classic uh, determinism is gone. What would this person do? Um, you know, it's, it's a very startling thing. They want to figure out uh, what to do about it. It's very unlikely they're going to make the leap to quantum mechanics from Newton to the feet. No way in hell are they going to. They could do idiot things like add stochastic terms to Newton's law and say, ha, I'm making it not, uh, not deterministic. That's too dumb. Um, but what they could do is say, look, this is such a huge leap that it must be that the, this determinism that I think is hardwired into Newton's picture of the world isn't actually there. And that means that there should be possible to talk about my physics right now under my feet in a way that doesn't make such heavy use of that principle that's not actually there. Of course, that's the way they that, actually that, did that, it was applying true thought to the well, experiments for it's, it's actually true. Well, 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 we, we could, uh, I don't want to take uh, uh, too long with this. In fact, Hamilton was very close to the path of but, uh, but what I want to say is that there was a clue in the structure of classical physics, which was the, the possibility of reformulating classical physics in terms of the principle of least action. It's very startling when you learn the principle of least action. It's a way of thinking about physics where determinism is not the star of the show. It's very strange when you first learn about it. How can it be that the particle sniffs out every path that it, that it can take from A to B and choose a path that minimizes the action? It just happens that with the rules, you follow the rules, and it ends up being equivalent to Newton's laws, but it's from this radically philosophically different starting point. So, so um, I think that's something that we can uh, explore. We're trying to understand standard physics from a point of view that doesn't hardwire in these notions of locality, and even the notion of quantum mechanical Hilbert space, which is uh, built into our current description, but we have indications from uh, from, from gravity and from cosmology might be approximate, might have to go with. So I'm going to try to stimulate more questions from the oh, Risa. Um, and I'll come back to Barry. Risa, meet me halfway. Since you're picking on me. Um, so I thought it was really lovely in a lot of uh, ways in the last few days how it seemed to me that there's a, a little bit of a, sh even though the connection between particle physics and cosmology is, is not new, it seems to me that there was a little bit of a shift towards an appreciation of the breadth of astrophysical discoveries that can contribute to our understanding of fundamental physics in, in dark matter, in, in acceleration, even in inflation. Um, so I think that's really exciting, but it also presents a lot of um, 
sociological challenges. So I, I maybe ask the panel, uh, or even the young people in the audience, <laughs> even better, uh, of your views about how do we best facilitate that communication and education across these fields so that we can be more, most productive. Thank you, Risa. Uh, panel, anyone want to respond? So I can, I can bring in the view from, from Europe of what's happened. Uh, in, in, in Europe, the points that you were raising are, are well known, understood, and now the communities are working uh, together, together in various uh, initiatives. I mean, CERN is, uh, is now pushing for uh, a program of uh, small experiments which are not, uh, uh, not collider. Uh, but uh, they are looking for new directions where we can do fundamental physics in the various ways, but still the, uh, the expertise of the lab can be used. Uh, recently in Europe, APEC, which is the coordinating body for astroparticle physics in Europe, has uh, launched uh, an initiative for, uh, for a center uh, coordinating the activity of astroparticle and the hub that being the theory department of CERN. Uh, so we are directly involved uh, in the organization of that. And that, uh, the choice of CERN for me is very positive because it, 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 uh, it offers the link between the community of particle physics and the particle, which has always existed, but that should uh, strengthen uh, uh, this, these links. So uh, in Europe, there is uh, it is starting to have uh, more and more efforts to achieve the dream that you see. So uh, Barry Medor, Mike brought up the example of differencing images. That brings up time domain. With bigger and larger telescopes, we can now start doing time differencing at higher and higher redshift with these fast radial bursts that are definitely at cosmological distances, we are now sampling things at very high cadence. Are there experiments, are there things in the time domain in cosmology that could illuminate particle physics or cosmology? Is this a piece of uh, parameter space that we should be thinking about? I think it depends which time scales we're talking about. I think um, for some of the things, um, it's just really important to know our, our, dis our distributions in equilibrium. A lot of the time, we assume they are, and we're putting bounds or predicting things. And I think just a, as, as, a, I mean, as a step to being able to use the data, I think we really have to understand um, any indications of deviations from equilibrium. It's kind of a boring answer, but I think it's actually really important. More questions from the audience because, uh, oh, I see Simon White's hand up. Because we're going to move on to the summary talks and you don't get to ask any more questions after when we get into that phase. I just wanted to push back a bit at John's uh, statement of the view from Europe. Because I, I want to offer a different view from Europe, which is that I get nervous to hear that the largest scientific organization in the world is reaching out to coordinate a program of smaller experiments. Because I think over planning is one of the main things that suppresses creativity. And I think what we would like young people to do is to follow their own curiosity. And so coordination smacks of telling people what to do and what they should be thinking about. And I, I don't think this is a good thing. Um, you know, we've had many examples, but another one we can think about is I don't think any th theorist in physics in the 1960s or 70s would have predicted that the new insights into the equation of state of nuclear matter at extremely high densities will be led by experiments we're looking for inter interstellar scintillation of radio wavelengths. But that is in fact what happened because those experiments discovered pulsars. And I, think we, I think this is a, a, a point that Lisa was making too. We can't really tell where things are coming from. You have to look and be sensitive to things. And you know, too much preconditioning actually reduces the sensitivity to new, new phenomena. So I would like to you know, make sure that there's still room for 
individual curiosity to drive discovery. So Simon uh, is channeling the free range children movement in, in the United States. I keep saying free range, uh, I keep thinking chicken. <laughs> well, a, the, uh, the, the, you know, we don't want to over program children, and they're talking about free range. Those people who have young enough to have children have heard of the free range children movement, as opposed to uh, you know deciding everybody every, everything by committees. Any any. A short, a short reply. Very yeah. short. So absolutely, this initiative wants to foster independence of thinking, and it's certainly not stifling it. Uh, it's only for theory. It's not for experiment. So it's not that CERN says which experiment has to be done in astrophysics. physics. Uh, simply because of, uh, there were not much resources and theory is cheap, so the idea was starting with, uh, with theory. But CERN is on, only uh, the central hub of a network of activity. So when I say coordinating, I didn't mean that uh, sending orders of what people should work on, but uh, rather offering the possibilities of uh, visiting, of uh, uh, exchanges, uh, visitors program, visitor program, uh, conferences, and things like that. So it goes in the direction of uh, fostering um, let's see. Let's see if we have. There's time for one more question before we go on Can to the. Can make a very, very brief comment? A very, very brief comment about that. Uh, I don't think we have time for a very, very brief comment from you. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the question about uh, uh, sociology, uh, given all these things that go on and so on. Just a, a comment for uh, for theorists. If you're a theorist, if you're a grad student in theory. The whole point of theoretical physics is it's a giant unified subject. You can work on everything. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. But I would say and, uh, that it's really important to like learn to deal, interact with experiment, read experimental plots, know how to talk to experimentalists. It's important to do that young. It's important to do that to start learning how to do that in grad school. Formal mathematical stuff is easy. You learn it in textbooks. And, you know, a lot of people do it. This business about interacting with data and talking to each other, that's hard. That's actually, that's, those are, those are uh, skills that are, um, that you can only pick up sort of by osmosis. And it's, it's, really like doing right? yeah. Yeah. it's true, you can learn it, but, but it, it, it's certainly easier uh, if, you, if you do it uh, yeah, early. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's thank our panel. And um, we're going to have two final talks. They're not really summary talks, but the two talks are supposed to address the question, um, disruption or convergence? Where, where are we? And it's the two Joes, Joe Silk uh, and Joe Licken. And uh, by convention, the astrophysicist gets to go first. Um, and so as Joe comes up, to uh, set up his computer. You want to do that or do you need help? Okay. Um, I think this would be, um, I'm not sure why everyone's leaving. Uh, I think this is a time where we, we have thanked uh, Rocky and the other organizers. We thanked Amy, but we haven't thanked you all for coming and we haven't thanked the Kavli Foundation uh, for making this possible. So let's do that. So we will have two views on whether we're close to disruption or convergence. And the first one is uh, Joe Silk, and I'm choking at institutions because the list of institutions includes uh, Institut d'Astrophysique, uh, Oxford, and Johns Hopkins. Did I miss any? And let's get you a microphone.
everybody. I'd like to first start by thanking uh, the organizers, and especially uh, Michael and Rocky and the others, for really creating this stimulating environment. It's been very successful in, uh, in I guess, in the great tradition of inner space, outer space. And um, let's see what I can do to try to speak as that's a physicist and uh, give you a little perspective on this. So um, the question I was posed was convergence or disruption? Well, where are we going? Um, and I am um, uh, very much biased towards convergence, as you'll see eventually. But let me sort of begin um, by trying to differentiate between the perspectives of master physics and particle physics. Um, so here's an example. Um, imagine that you're in, um, this is a test. Um, so you have a room full of astrophysicists, and you pose this question. You show them just one slide, and then you repeat, you repeat the experiment uh, with a room full of particle physicists. And all they're shown is this one image. Okay. Okay. Black swan. Okay. So what? is the physicist's perspective on this. Well, he will say, he or she will say, um, at least one swan has a black side. I mean, that is clear. Um, and then let's consider a herd of these unilateral swans. And you can ask, you know, is left-right parity conserved? Would their progenitor be asymmetrically left or right, black or white? Um, swan negritude is truly a rare thing because we haven't seen these before in our experience. It's the greatest problem in biophysics, and this is what motivates our picture of a multiverse. Okay, so, um, very good. Okay, now let's move on to the astronomer who um, maybe takes a slightly different view. Um, some swans are white, some are black. Perhaps some are black and white. We're just seeing one side after all. Therefore, um, we're going to call to the funding agencies to a major research initiative to build ultra-sensitive swan detectors to perform large-scale swan simulations to compute swan correlations with fissure matrix, etc., and even study swan non-Gaussianity. <laughs> right, okay, so, well, there you have it. That, 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 that all will go well. So then, um, let's move on to Dr. Meadows. So I'm... I am very impressed by the fact that um, um, there are some skeptics, of course, that dark matter is best described as a weakly interacting um, particle field. It seems very, very compelling. Um, but all the experimental tests so far have been frustrating. So, for example, um, at CERN, um, we uh, look for um, uh, events. Let's begin with um, underground detection scattering uh, of dark matter particles of protons, giving recoils, no success so far. Um, the indirect detection, where there are concentrations of dark matter near the galactic center um, and in dwarf galaxies. Um, again, we should expect some self-annihilation signal in many models. They even, even measure the simplest generic models. And so far, we've seen nothing. And then back to CERN, where we do uh, high energy collisions and look for missing um, um, energy events. And so far, uh, no, nothing has been reported. OK, so where, what do we take from this? Well, um, first, we have to continue looking harder, doing more sensitive experiments, that's for sure. Because uh, as you heard, we're nowhere near exhausting the parameter space possible um, for dark matter particles or, or fields or whatever. Um, uh, we maybe should be looking elsewhere for other types of dark matter candidates. And maybe, I would say, as a last resort, um, because I am very impressed by Einstein gravity, consider modifying gravity. And that is a, is a very worthwhile enterprise, of course. Um, but it has succeeded so well so far. Um, let's talk about dark matter. I said there was a broad perspective. So extending the search for dark matter is um, a very useful thing to do because of the vast parameter space we have to search um, all the way from I don't know, 10 to the minus 25 electron volts up to maybe particles, quote, quotation marks that might be <coughs> 10 to 100 to solar masses, um, maybe by like holes. So how are we doing there? Well, it's interesting. Um, you saw uh, this presented a number of times. Um, this is the uh, 
cross-section versus mass. And so far, we have these wonderful um, limits ever getting better. So go to one ton, eventually 10 ton, 100 ton detectors, we'll be hitting the neutrino floor. But there is a vast uh, array still of parameter space, if I go down to a GeV, that's um, only beginning to be explored. And, but why stop at a GeV? And so if we can go um, with um, just no, no longer quite maybe the same compelling model, but definitely very good models at adding um, dark photon mediators, for example, we go down to exploring a parameter space that goes all the way down to MEV or below. And um, that's, that's, you know, that's giving work to many, many experimental groups around the world. Um, and um, maybe if we're lucky, we'll find something there. So I, I think that's a worthwhile enterprise. Um, and it's, it, it's, you know, it's never time, certainly not time to abandon um, the dark matter search and go for a, a more gravity, modified gravity. Okay. Um, but what about the look elsewhere approach? So another very interesting direction has come from uh, primordial black holes, originally proposed by Stephen Hawking as a dark matter candidate many years ago. Um, it was it, 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 revived after the, the LIGO discoveries of black holes that were more massive than the then known and still known astrophysical counterparts, um, and um, of tens to, at that time, tens to 50 solar masses. Um, Models were soon built to explain these astrophysically. Um, we're now moving on in mass even, some of the latest events by rumor release are up to 100 solar masses. It may be slightly harder to make those astrophysically, but they are possibly very rare. So that's fascinating. Um, and other arguments are constraining the fraction of dark matter these primordial black holes could be. And so it's probably true at the moment that um, the only real window remaining is in the sort of asteroid mass range. Um, between the Hawking evaporation limits and the micro-lensing limits from um, Supreme Can um, on M31. So there's a few decades of mass there, which um, people are very, very interested in now in terms of trying both to form these in the early universe, uh, pre-inflation, post-inflation, uh, presumably post-inflation, but pre-reheating or after reheating. There are all sorts of possibilities being actively explored. So, and it's using, um, in many cases, you're just varying initial conditions, you're sticking with known physics, uh, reasonably known physics, you know, it's, a, it's a, in a high energy range, and you know, it's, it's maybe to, to many people seems less exotic in terms of inventing physics. After all, black holes do exist, we have no problem with that, we're not inventing brand new particles. And um, so uh, the, 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 perhaps the current word here is the primary black holes can certainly do the job, and we desperately need to find um, both theories of forming them and better signals, uh, possibly, for example, they would be um, uh, giving gravity wave signals. It's, it, it, there are many suggestions about this, and this will come in, in the future. Stochastic background of waves um, from these primordial black holes interaction between themselves and with um, more massive black holes that could be swallowed up, over, for example. Okay, um, so let me now turn to dark energy. It, it's maybe not so widely known, but in 1933, Metra wrote this rather amazing paper where he talked about the way to say the dark matter in the vacuum, P equals minus rho c squared. So that was known at the dawn of quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, and since then, you know, fast forward 80 years or so, it's still W equals minus 1, but obviously in vastly, vastly inferior um, So we're now looking at the, you know, the few percent level um, uh, in this part of the Take for a W minus one versus the density, density of the universe. And three different types of probes converge, and um, it seems uh, we now have to weigh the fact what do we do next? Um, we're now at the few percent level. Um, do we design, and we are designing, in a sense of experiments to look for deviations, but so far there's been no hint of a deviation. Uh, that's the worrying thing, and so. You, you can imagine that when you propose a new experiment now, to, which may be very, very expensive, because you have to do the current ones, um, we have ones coming up, obviously, like, like um, LSST, and if you want to go beyond that, they don't find anything. Then one has to very carefully weigh the prospects of discovery, which is expense, there's other, other you know, needs in, in the astrophysics particles community to, to do this. So can we either justify um, 
you know, building new and more powerful, more expensive telescopes to reduce those error bars. Um, I, I think the answer is not clear. Um, if, if there was sufficient motivation for part of the physics, maybe that would, um, uh, th that, that would aid us. But my, my fear is that, um, uh, you know, that so far I don't think there's been maybe a stronger case of the like with specific models, that is, specific predictions of what one might look for. We have a whole vast array of predictions, and it's a bit like you know, wandering in the dark, I think, to ask what one would expect from the new experiments. So when I began in astrophysics, this was what dark matter was like. And halos were basically thought to be giant dark uh, logs dominating a, a galaxy like ours. And the amazing revolution that came about was thanks to computer simulations, um, where the dark matter was um, uh, really followed, um, uh, just, uh, just dark matter particles, uh, non-interacting, um, under gravity, and um, this is something one can do reasonably accurately over the years, um, and none of the complications of, 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 of baryons. And the, the, one of the main predictions was this vast number of small blobs. Here's the main central galaxy, and many of these small blobs should turn into dwarf galaxies. Now, of course, we found many dwarf galaxies at the last count in order 50 or 60 around the Milky Way, even. you have to look very closely to see these, they're very faint, which are dominated by dark matter and uh, have tiny baryon fractions, just in some cases, just a few hundreds of stars. You get hundreds of millions of star masses, perhaps, in dark matter. Um, so this is really interesting, um, but the numbers expected seem very large. Um, and if you look at a, a real galaxy, I mean, the, the contrast is just amazing. I mean, between, obviously, it's all the baryons and the stars we're seeing here, but you see, you know, the odd small blob around, but, um, and if you look more carefully, maybe you'll find a few more, but you have some very complex physics making stars and lighting up the, the spiral arms, etc. But there's dark matter everywhere, and um, most of it does not seem to have enough uh, of these blobs in. And so basically, you know, too many dwarfs are predicted. So this, this was the origin of the dwarf galaxy discussions of anomalies of possible problems in the standard astrophysical view of structure formation. Okay, and the big question that comes up, of course, is do we need new physics to explain this? These deviations from what you might call the canonical, just to get standard model of particle physics, we have a canonical lambda CDM model, which fits beautifully with large-scale structure, so it's, it's a canonical model, but it seems to have issues on small scales. And these issues now have gone beyond simply counting the numbers of these dwarfs, but now it turns out many of the dwarfs have, most of them maybe have cores in dark matter, and these are not seen directly in the numerical simulations, the ones that do attempt to focus on the dwarfs and resolve those, um, that's an issue. There's also a large diversity in the inner profiles, which you can measure because the test particles, the stars and the faintest dwarfs, um, you can measure their circular velocities, so they, they sample the gravity profile, they sample the dark matter for you, and um, there's a wide range in, in, in the shapes of these cores um, um, and in the other properties of the dwarf galaxies. And so this is said to be a diversity problem. You might think if you had one particular solution that came from new physics, it would not easily give you that diversity. Some, some disagree with that, others do, and even the question why the diversity is not fully understood. And there's another issue called the two big fail problem, which I won't say any detail. That's simply the simulations now, and the problem with those, they predict a, a, a large number of dwarfs in some intermediate mass range, which certainly um, should be robust enough to have had stars in, and we don't see enough of those either. So those are some of the problems. There are others too, but these are the major ones that we focused on, and uh, it stimulated um, two approaches. So one is that the baryon physics that goes into making any galaxy, let alone a dwarf, is incredibly complicated. Um, we only have local examples of how stars are made very near us. In our vicinity of the Milky Way, um, we base all of our um, theoretical models that when we try to apply to the distant universe on what we see locally in nearby dense clouds, or we get more or less see stars forming in nearby star forming galaxies. We, we apply this very, very far away billions of years in the past or whatever, and it's a slightly dangerous thing to do, and what's more, we can't even resolve the details when we try to simulate large patches of the universe, I'll come to that in a moment. So, so uh, the physics that goes in includes many aspects of um, 
the ingredients of a complex that might form stars, which might include turbulence, it certainly includes gravity, obviously, and fragmentation, and coalescence, and magnetic fields certainly play a role in the nearby universe, and how you apply what we see to the distant universe, to the first stars, the next generation, etc., the galaxies we see with the big telescopes, which are used as probes of cosmology, all this is, makes one a little bit nervous to see how universal we can do this. Anyway, having said all this, um, you know, there's again um, a, a, a community that, that believes, and I'm part of this too, sometimes, not every day, but alternate days perhaps, that believes that we need to have new physics um, to explain some of these dwarf galaxy anomalies. And there are beautiful examples. I mean, the, the first one that really got developed was a co concept of warm dark matter. And so warm dark matter basically suppresses the power from the free streaming length of a neutrino with a certain mass um, on small scales. And so therefore you can um, you know, reduce the number of dwarfs. And, and there are other ways to solve some of these other problems. So that addressed one of the problems. And there's even this fascinating uh, evidence which won't go away for a sterile neutrino with, uh, which emits a 3.5 uh, kV X-ray line. Okay, that will be a 7 kV sterile neutrino. So that's a possible candidate, very controversial still. Um, but the trouble is that um, if you want to invent a model like this, and there are some much more exotic models around, such as self-interacting dark matter and uh, fuzzy dark matter, you need to have a very high threshold that you need new physics to explain astrophysics. So maybe Einstein had that high threshold when he used the precession of Mercury's perihelion to move forward. But I, I worry that we are at that point yet. Yeah. Now, this doesn't mean to say we should not explore full particle physics uh, uh, attempts to, to resolve these anomalies, and maybe there will be a new signature that could connect us more carefully. You need a multi messenger approach, basically, to see these particles go elsewhere. Okay, so that's my diatribe on small galaxies. Now, we all think that big galaxies no problem whatsoever, they're part of the standard model, but we're beginning to see little cracks in the edifice here too. I've no idea uh, whether these will stand up in time, but this is more an issue with our attempts to simulate um, structures in the very early universe. So we can look back at the universe now to redshifts of eight, nine, or 10, and see the first galaxies, and some of them are surprisingly massive. And we can see the first um, black holes um, way back, and some of them are amazingly massive. Now a black hole, for example, grows by gas accretion, and a very canonical time scale for the gas accretion called the saltpeter time, which is a certain number of you know, uh, uh, millions of years of order 40. But if you go back far enough, there isn't time to have enough accretion to grow that black hole. So this has led to interesting questions, and you can, you can calculate what the seed might be to make these. And if you go back to very high region, you find that you don't only have time to start off with enormously massive seeds, maybe 100 million, maybe or tens of thousands, but something in this range, um, in order to have time to build up these things. Now, astrophysicists are very ingenious. They have other ways to do this, but they're highly, I would say, artificial. Um, they may be right, okay, but the astrophysical solutions do it. But this is an indicator that you know, something might be wrong. It's another chink in our standard model to say that maybe there is need for extra small-scale power to provide the seeds. And that, this is getting worse. So here is the latest simulations on the right and the data on the left. And what you see in the data is simply the numbers of galaxies at very high redshift, which are very bright, being picked up with the telescope. So it seems that our current simulations, um, this is the illustrious TNG group, which take you up to here, fall way short of the numbers of superluminous galaxies at high redshift. Now we've no idea, I think, to be fair, what is going on. This could be another chink in the armor. Probably all it is really saying is that our simulations don't have the right, the right mix of physics in yet, most likely. But it could also be indicators that we might need to see. If we had some interesting seeds, primordial black holes, the obvious example of the seed, there could be others, there could be extra power in some weird dark matter particle, that would give you the head start that you might need to do some of this. Okay. Okay, so here is uh, another challenge which is really discussed these days. And these are, it turns out that a large fraction of the nearby galaxies in the universe nearby with the 20 megaparsecs around us, um, are extremely thin and without bulges. Okay. Now this is really difficult to understand, and I want to show you the data, which was 
gathered by uh, today's laureate, uh, Jim Peebles. He's been working on this for a number of years. And so he, he's, he's been obsessed by this as, as a problem with astrophysics. And he, he you know, points out to these incredibly no central body of stars. Why should there be a central body of stars? We think that galaxies spin up uh, in part from initial conditions of the early universe that should enable them to transfer momentum, <coughs> and there should be a lot of stars in the center. That's one reason. Uh, and there'd be lots of hot heating in the process by you know, these random motion and turbulence. So galaxies, it's hard to make them thinner without the bulge, theoretically. People are succeeding if they tweak the conditions enough. But then also, we now have some of these intriguing dark matter models, which are massive solitons in, for example, among others, these things can easily heat up galaxies. And so getting these things is, is a real challenge. Um, and they thought metal track stars make bulges too. So there are, this is the first 19 Jim showed us, and then, and then here's another sample. And you just, just, you just notice how, how incredibly thin these things are. And I, I don't think anyone has successfully explained these in the simulation community as um, something that should be as common as this. You can make maybe rare ones like this, but it's hard to make them common. And they seem to be relevant common. Okay, so that's, that's an issue. Uh, now, um, maybe the answer is this. That we just have to have better simulations with better resolution. Maybe this is what's going to solve the problem. Well, that may be true. But let me just show you where we are now with galaxy formation simulations. Okay, this is from a recent review by one of the in this conference. And these are all the many ingredients that go in to the simulations. You start off with gas, you have an interstellar medium, you have to make stars, you have feedback, that is, stars that form a massive, they push things around, um, you may, you will make supermassive black holes, and stuff runs away and perhaps in the center, that seems natural, the central point is denser, there's important <coughs> fields that play some role in controlling the motions of the gas, and radiation was caused the All these are ingredients you have to put in, most of them cannot be resolved because they occur on such small scales but you can never resolve them in the next century on a computer. We, we put this all into what is called subgrid physics. Okay? We make empirical rules for these things. And then, you know, based on the best ideas that we have, and the best, so these simulations make amazingly beautiful pictures. I mean, you look at some of these galaxies, this is the whole suite of modern solar simulations, different groups around the world. You can't tell the difference practically between these and real galaxies. Now, what does this mean um, exactly? Um, it's certainly not telling us the simulations are robust and have any predictive power at all. It says they're very successful at explaining the universe we can see. But I, one has to worry, given all this complex physics that's gone into them, just how robust they, they will be for predicting what goes on in this universe. And astrophysics really is very reactive to observations. One has to remember that, and as the imagine change, things change. Okay, yeah, are they predictable? Okay. Um, so if you don't trust simulations, let's try the other approach. You write down some equations to do semi-analytic modeling based originally on the trajectory idea. Beautiful, beautiful focus. This gets away from believing in pictures. Back to equations. Let's calculate. What do you do? Okay, so um, this is one of the most successful programs. These are all the parameters that go into the theory. And here's a few more in the same theory of all 50. You have to adjust all of these parameters. This was from a few years ago. Here's the latest one. Um, Okay, so that's their, their parameters, their parameters. So in, anyway, the point of this is, it doesn't matter what the details are, is that you have many, many things to tweak. And again, you know, it's wonderful to use these things to make your predictions if you have some weird particle physics theory of making clumps of galaxies. But you have to remember just they're not necessarily, you know, you, you could change these overnight if you tweak some of these parameters. <coughs> so do we need radical rethinking? Okay. So, in a dwarf galaxy, I showed you uh, that I said there was a real problem. Suppose you had a black hole in the center. In some cases, we directly see evidence for this. But these are thousand, ten thousand, hundreds of solar masses. They're called intermediate mass black holes. Okay, very few are needed. It's a tiny fraction of mass in the universe. This is part of our black hole population. They're, those black holes have incredible reactive effect, especially in low potential worlds or galaxies, and can really mess things up. They're, they're, we have no one is really worried about these things yet, but LISA, it's wonderful, it's exactly in the middle of the LISA window to, to test for the presence of mergers of such black holes, which happen to never be in the universe, and so we'll know maybe in 2034 what's going on there. Uh, and likewise, for massive galaxies, it's normally believed that we need something, we, we don't see enough very massive galaxies compared to the earlier simulations. We solve that problem, 
by adding a supermassive black hole in the middle. And it basically quenches star formation. But, you know, maybe it doesn't just do that. Maybe in the early phase, this black hole, which puts out jets of incredible power, winds of incredible power, crushes the clouds around it and helps them make more stars. So you suddenly get an induced burst of star formation on a time scale that's shorter than the normal gravitational time, so it happens quickly. And then those clumps that make stars, make massive stars, and then from those, more supernovae, more exploding stars, plus the continuing alpha, will then disperse everything. But it's possible that this black hole that could actually give you the extreme star formation. Again, things you have to correlate both black hole formation and star formation together in the galaxy, and it's difficult to, to, to get to the physics of that. We certainly haven't done that yet. People not normally think in a merger, you get the you know, stimulate appreciation of black hole, it's really just three stars, and the two things more or less happen at the same time, they don't feed back on each other very much apart from the driving of the <coughs> So all of this will be clarified too, I think, um, with our newest telescope to be launched in 2021, the James Webb. So that's, that's again a great future for, uh, for, for the future of empirical driving of galaxy information theory. Okay, so um, I think we have four pathways here to explore, okay? Um, you have to try harder with known physics, okay? Um, you have to look harder in the data for evidence of the new phenomena. Um, you should definitely be testing new dark matter physics and then also consider modifying gravity. Okay, just a few words to tell us before I close up on tensions and parameters. Um, we have a five sigma tension at the moment between the early and the late universe. Could this be systematics? Okay, so this is, one event. This is just one example of possible systematics. It is found empirically there is a slight difference between um, supernovae in different environments. In the star forming environment, which applies to all of the 19 calibrated Cepheid supernova <coughs> galaxies in the very nearby universe, um, they're in the star forming region. So that means the supernovae are mostly the young ones from, from massive stars in binary systems and transfer energy onto a white dwarf, a uh, massive white dwarf, which then goes supernova. But there's another model for supernova which are delayed, simply white dwarf mergers, old stars merging, and that dominates in old environments. And it so happens that when you go to the local Hubble floor, you get roughly a 50 50 mix of the two types of variants, half spiral, half ellipticals. And we know the data to really be enough, precise enough to study those supernovae, their environments in detail. It's just a poor brush, poor brush opinion on us at the moment, and we try to correct for that. But again, if one took this seriously, the difference between the two types of supernovae goes in the right direction to bring down the Hubble constant um, from um, the high emission value to something lower. Whether it probably won't go all the way, but you know, it's going to reduce the tension to some extent. So it's also theory. So theory is this beautiful idea now that um, they've tried everything pretty much. And so it's, if you can basically do something in the early universe to speed things up a bit, you can also bring your way down um, to, to the Hubble constant that we venture today in what is roughly a young universe. Um, and, and you do that by putting in a pulse of dark energy at roughly mammal energy quality. Um, this uh, has yet to be confirmed. It's a hypothesis. It's, it's uh, an ex you know, pretty extreme thing to do, tail to find the observations. But it's 10% you know, of the energy that's in the time. It's a huge effect, actually. But this will do, could do the effect. That's, that's the theoretical hope that we have at the moment. But it doesn't go all the way. It doesn't get you from, from the, um, the 73 measured locally down to the 68 signal measured by plane. It gets you halfway between. So that's a, you know, it reduce the tension just like the other region. So what do we do next? OK, we have to better understand dark matter in the galaxy. New data plays a role. Here's the classical data, um, galactic center. Um, we're seeing the second pulsars, lots of them. And there are maybe many fainter ones, too. Uh, to give you the general excess, excess flow. Um, uh, so it could be, there is room left for the standard WIMPs. We have another clue that's not been understood for many years now. There's a 511 kV line emitted over the central region, similar energetics to, to the practices of gamma rays. Um, and yet we do not know the source of this. We speculate it might be, again, um, old X-ray binaries, very faint X-ray binaries. It could equally be a dark matter signal, we have no idea. And here's a new one, um, which is ionization of molecules. We're in the same central regions, we have 100 times ionization than we actually uh, see in the measurements by Voyager 1, which is the Columbia and the And that, you know, that, that's a worry too. So let me, um, we don't have a theory. There are many other possibilities, but this part of this signal could be a dark matter signal. It's in the same area exactly, so it's an interesting group, totally different. So Gaia, billions of stars, precise distances, 
These are new results from Gaia, which are the first dark matter blobs identified. Very high mass light ratio, remnants of galaxies, everything else is stripped off. Um, you do many orbits and you, and you include the various regions of these, identify uh, tokens. Fine. Um, I was going to talk one minute. CMB horizons, um, uh, new horizons, CMB. We have to do better on the spectrum of the CMB. It wouldn't be amazing if we could measure the recombination lines from the early universe. That's a new challenge for the next half century, maybe, so far. And we will get a guaranteed signal from all the small stuff in the universe that, that was damped away by friction with the microwave background very early on that doesn't survive in the microwave background. And we, we can also um, measure primordial helium in its truly primordial state. So that's amazing, too. And we need new experiment. And so the, the finding of the dark age is another pristine part of the universe, unexplored, just beginning to be explored, but the difficulty is we don't have enough modes if we just use CMB or large scale structure. You don't hear about the number of pixels or the number of galaxies. As you go back down to the smaller scales, you suddenly can pick up all the small things. You only get them if you can look early and see the building blocks of the galaxies, get these hydrogen clouds, very high ratio. You look for them in the dark ages, silhouetted against the microwave background, and in principle you can pick up all these modes. And to do this, however, you have to go from the environment where there's no Earth's ionosphere, you work and get 30 megahertz, um, no terrestrial uh, you know, radar, etc. Okay, finally, um, be wary of advocating new physics to account for us anomalies until you've understood the complexities of the development school. That, that's my message, and um, extraordinary encouragement. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the astrophysics point of view. Joe gave us a lot to think about, and you said we're closer to convergence. In astrophysics, in astrophysics. Okay. Uh, for another point of view, uh, I invite Joe Licken from Fermi Lab to come up. to give a talk and gives me detailed instructions on what he wants, I just ignore them and talk about whatever I want. But this time I'm actually going to do what he asked me, which is I'm going to take uh, four of the main questions that were talked about here and tell you my opinion on whether they're headed towards uh, convergence or disruption. Uh, the caveat is that I am not a cosmologist and nowadays I'm only barely a particle physicist, so the opinions that I'm expressing here are not in any way Formed by particular expertise in the, in the subjects. But nevertheless, let's see what we have. So let's start with uh, the early late uh, whole constant tension, convergence or disruption. My prediction convergence. Why do I think that? First of all, let me start by saying it is a triumph of precision astronomy to see the kind of mature data analysis that was presented and argued about at this conference. Uh, we particle physicists used to poo-poo the astros uh, when it came to, to data, especially with precision analysis. We are not going to do that anymore. Uh, you guys are, are, are in a really impressive uh, state, both in, in terms of the kind of data you have, the multiple overlapping uh, 
uh, tools you have in this sort of maturity of, of the discussions going on. So that's all great. On the other hand, uh, having gotten into that mature phase, uh, tensions are going to happen. Uh, as Roger said yesterday, tensions are normal. In the world of particle physics, we have learned to be very patient about such tensions. They can, they can take a decade or more to resolve. I don't know if that will be the case here, but it's certainly possible. Based on historical precedent, not my any expertise on, on the details, uh, I would agree with what uh, Roger said uh, last night, which is uh, I think the current tension is more likely to be caused by some combination of systematics, measurement issues, extra issues, rather than new fundamental ingredients. I think the case was made here that there's no particular smoking gun that you know you just resolve this weak point that it can go away. But this is often the case for these tensions. It turns out it's a combination of things that you have to figure out. I wanted to make one detailed point there, uh, which has to do with this idea of five sigma significance, what that means. Uh, there were a couple of references to the five sigma gold standard. I want to uh, make it clear, especially to the young people in the audience, in particle physics, where we use five sigma a lot, five sigma deviation is a necessary but not sufficient condition to claim the discovery. Uh, one reason for this is that, this was pointed out to me, it was beaten into my head actually by Bob Cousins, who's a, an expert on this uh, from UCLA. In the real world, there's no such thing as a five sigma Gaussian deviation, because in the real world, distributions are never Gaussian out that far. And the reason they aren't is because real world distributions always end up having these, these what are called flat, non-Gaussian tails once you get out far enough. In fact, this particular plot I got from a, a web page uh, talking about the stock market. So this is a very, very general phenomenon. And so when you talk about a uh, five sigma deviation, you have to be very careful. You work very, very hard, and you saw that in the, in the talks here, to get a, a reliable estimate of your one sigma uncertainty, including all the systematics. But then when you see an excursion that's five times the one sigma value, that does not mean the probability of that is what you would get by taking a Gaussian uh, five sigma p value, which is one in 10 million or whatever it is. And it's because of these tails. So five sigma significance doesn't really mean what you think it means in terms of probability. In fact, in the CMS experiment, we, we, nom we fit nominally Gaussian distributions, not with Gaussians, but with with a function that apparently was made up by the Babar collaboration. It's called the Croy function. It's named after a soccer player for reasons that I don't understand. But, <laughs> but it's a Gaussian that has these tails built in. Because we know the tails are there, so you should, you should build them into your, to your face. So that's one point. Second point is that, again, if you look at just a historical record, that some five figma discrepancies get resolved by an eventual community consensus to discount some particular experiment or set of measurements but not because we actually figured out what was wrong with them. So an example of this is in the plots that you've seen uh, several times uh, in this conference, there's a, a, this experiment called DAMA, which actually saw a signal for dark matter. So what do, we, what do we do about that? As far as I know, nobody has figured out what's wrong with DAMA, but we have over time de-weighted it such that it doesn't affect the, the, our statements about dark matter searches. So this is okay, the Bayesian way of, of doing this, as you get more information, you, you reevaluate your posterior, so it's, that's a, it's a valid scientific thing to do. I don't know if that's going to happen here, uh, but it's possible. So that's the first subject. Second subject, these are getting kind of harder as I go along. Uh, explanation of co the cosmic acceleration, the dark energy that we see now, convergence or disruption? My prediction? Disruption. Why do I say that? Um, first of all, um, th this discussion usually starts with what uh, Joe Silk was calling the worst prediction in physics, this 120 order magnitude discrepancy between uh, a, what I would call a naive calculation that vacuum energy is, is measured by uh, cosmic expansion, the, the measurement versus the, your naive uh, estimate of what it ought to be. So that's a, the theory, theory part of this is embarrassing. And to me, it shows something obvious, which is that we don't know how to do the calculation of this theoretically. It may be surprising that we don't know how to do it, but it's pretty clear that we don't know how to do it. <laughs> Second point is that uh, the LAC seems to be telling us that there's another related calculation that we also don't know how to do, which is we don't know how to understand uh, the Higgs mass and the electroweak scale, at least in naive extensions of the standard model, which is something that we thought we ought to be able to do, but we also seem to have a problem there. This is the naturalist problem <coughs> of extensions of the standard model. So what are we going to do about that? Well, th this really, I think, uh, needs some new disruptive idea, and I think uh, Nemo was hitting at that, at that 
that in the panel today. Uh, this is not a problem of the standard model itself, because in the standard model, uh, the Higgs mass and electric weak scale are, are in fact empirical parameters. The standard model is constructed in such a way that it's not supposed to predict these. And this was actually mentioned the other day in terms of the cosmological concept. Maybe you should just think of it as a empirical parameter. You can do that here in, in a self-consistent way, but I think that's not ambitious enough and of course we'd like to do that. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that in uh, particle physics, we do have the ability to predict scales. And in particular, it's a triumph of the standard model <coughs> that the QCD scale is predicted. It's predicted in terms of the log running of some dimensionless parameter starting at wherever you want. You can even start at the Planck scale of your ambitions. So it's not that we don't know how to predict uh, successfully uh, mass scales that, uh, that are not too different from the electroweak scale or, or the, uh, the scale of the cosmological constant. But uh, in, in those particular cases, we are badly failing. So what else? Uh, I want to uh, say a few words about naturalists. So we've been using naturalist arguments to motivate experimental searches for at least 35 years now. Here's, here's a slide from a talk in 1984 telling you uh, the super, part of, super partner particles you were going to find uh, mass less than W plus on mass. So, I would assert that, at least directly speaking, we have had zero success with these sorts of arguments for a long time. My personal belief is that these arguments are fundamentally wrong as applied to extensions of the standard model, but I, I can't prove that, but I, I hope some smart person in this audience will, will figure that out, and that would certainly be a disruptive idea. Uh, but I think it is uh, pretty clear that at the moment that this approach is not working very well. And when an approach is not working very well, maybe you ought to try alternative approaches. I don't think that's a very controversial statement. So for an example of that was in uh, Justin's talk yesterday, he was uh, instead emphasizing the near criticality of the Higgs, the fact that we seem to be sitting at this metastable point uh, with the Higgs. I, I also agree that that's a very important observation. Like John Judici and his collaborators were the pioneers of, of pointing this out. I think that is a very good place to put your attention. I don't know what it means, but I think it's a very good place to put your attention. So I'm going to make a specific suggestion here. My suggestion is that we uh, declare a, a voluntary 10-year moratorium on the use of the word naturalist in scientific publications. I don't think we have anything to lose by doing that. And I think it will encourage uh, these other ideas. <laughs> Now here's, here's an even harder one, multiverse. Multiverse or not, convergence or disruption, my prediction, disruption. Let me say a few things about that. This, this was a good exercise for me, but it, it, forced, it forced me to figure out what I really think. So here's what I really think. Okay, uh, Alan Guth said last night, uh, the hypothesis of eternal inflation as a generic mechanism for creating a multiverse is a, quote, plausible scientific theory, unquote. I agree with that statement. I think it is both plausible and scientific. It doesn't mean it's right, of course, but I think it's both plausible and scientific. By plausible, I mean that there's already substantial observational evidence for formal <coughs> inflation. I think that's certainly true. And at least in the, I think Mark Kamikowski was calling this, the ca cartoon version of inflation, of how inflation works, it appears that eternal inflation is generic. So that's plausible. Scientific, what I mean by that is that I can imagine that over time we would gather additional evidence that will either support, not necessarily prove, or disfavor, but not necessarily disprove this idea. So that's what I mean by plausible scientific. <coughs> Furthermore, I will point out to you that just because the rest of the punitive multiverse, if it's there, is not observable today, doesn't mean that we cannot, at some level of confidence, assert that it is there. And in fact, this goes back to the first scientific discovery that everybody in this room made. The first scientific discovery that you made was when you were about 18 months old, maybe sooner if you're really smart, when you discovered uh, the principle of object permanence, the fact that when your mom leaves the room, she doesn't cease to exist. Every child makes this discovery. The, the glory of this discovery is reflected in the world's most popular game, Peekaboo. That's why <laughs> kids like that game, because it is it's based on their first scientific discovery. And I think we're trying to do the same thing here. Yes, it's, 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 a, big, uh, it's a big lift, but I don't think it's unscientific. <coughs> uh, furthermore, I also agree with another statement that Alan said that once we develop a robust theory of universe formation, we might reasonably conclude, based on that, that it would be very odd if ours is the only instantiation of that mechanism. I don't think that's unreasonable to imagine. 
So those are all the nice things I'm going to say about the multiverse. <laughs> uh, what about anthropic arguments? So Alan also said, I would advocate anthropic explanations be thought of as explanations of last resort. I strongly agree with this statement. It's pretty obvious that certain features of our existence are explained at least in part by anthropic reasoning, so it's not that there's anything wrong with that. If they're applied sparingly and with rigor, uh, I think anthropic reasoning can be scientific, although there are various traps there. When you compare it to other similar exercises, you will realize this. My real concern is that we may be jumping to the last resort prematurely. <coughs> People may be doing that. Uh, I think this is a feature of, of those of us in the audience that are more senior. And, and I think we have uh, this, uh, this tendency, at least, uh, that to think that since we were too stupid to figure out a better explanation for the cosmological constant, um, that that's, that's all there is. But I, I don't think that's true. I think the younger generation is, by definition, smarter. And they figure this out with some disruptive like, uh, idea. And furthermore, I think it's our responsibility, those of us in the more senior generation, to support the possibility of radically new approaches rather than discounting it. So based on that, I'm pro proposing another moratorium. I propose a voluntary tenure moratorium on the use of the word anthropic and scientific. <laughs> we have nothing to lose, right? If it's the explanation of last resort, then we have nothing to lose by waiting 10 years. And let's let some of these other ideas flourish and then come back to this later. <laughs> last thing I wanted to mention is the connection between these ideas and string theory. So in my view, there's actually a pretty at least in my way of thinking, there's a very weak connection between what's going on in string theory and, and the idea of whether or not there's a multiverse. Um, it's true that uh, string theory might, it tells you something about the possibility of the multiverse, and it might even tell you something disruptive in the end. But I think that the argument that the only possible UV completions of the standard model of gravity are string theory, uh, and therefore string theory is the, the theory of the multiverse, I think that's a weak argument. And it's really based on the idea that nobody's thought of counterexamples. In my mind, string theory is better thought of as a theoretical laboratory for talking about these issues. I think it has been very productive in that sense, uh, especially in, in terms of ADS CFT. And that's not because I think we live in anti disinter space, it's because ADS CFT is a very important theoretical laboratory. So I think of string theory not as the theory of the universe, but as a, as a theoretical laboratory to think about things. So in that sense, I don't care so much what's in the landscape or what's in the small thing. It's interesting, and, and string theory should certainly be doing this, but I, it's not the thing that's going to tell us what's, what's the multiverse. So on the other hand, I think there are things that string theorists do do, which are, ought to be very interesting to all of the cosmologists in the room. Because after all, string theory potentially should also be able to tell us something about what's happening at t equals zero. Isn't that part of the reason that you want a theory of quantum gravity? And there are string theorists that work on this, thinking about cosmological singularities. However, the number of papers on this topic seem to be outweighed by the number of papers on this topic by approximately the log of 10 to the 500 to 1. And I don't quite understand why that is. This is a hard problem. It involves probably non perturbative things that we don't, you know, certainly don't understand. But it's not, this is a bad balance, if you ask me. Okay, so let me move on now to dark matter. I think this is my last topic. Dark matter beyond WIMPs, convergence or disruption? My prediction is disruption. So let me first say what I really think about WIMPs. I think, first of all, if we're honest, I think the main motivation for the 100 GeV scale WIMPs was supersymmetry, not the way with, with Miracle. So, okay, that's just the sociology of our field. However, having said that, I think the place where we're looking for WIMPs is a really good place to look. It's probably the best place to look. And not only is it the best place to look, but we have now incredibly powerful direct searches currently planned or underway due to the heroic efforts by Ellen and other people in this field. So this is very, very important. It's a huge success for our field. We need to push this as much as we can. Having said that, it's not the only place to look, even if it's the best place to look. And we ought to have a broader direct detection program that covers a larger fraction of the possibilities including the possible constraints. And in fact, we should be even thinking about worst case scenarios. What if dark matter particles have only gravitational or gravitational strength interactions with ordinary matter? What are we going to do? Just give up? I hope we're not going to give up. So we, should, we ought to be thinking of all, along those lines. 
So what's the good news for uh, dark matter? So first of all, I think there is overwhelming evidence that dark matter exists. I, I just don't buy at all that you, know, that you can explain it with a virgin gravity or something like that. So it's stuff, and it's stuff that we have to figure out what kind of stuff. I support the approach that advocated by Captain Zurich yesterday, with it was important in Denman and from Elena. I think Lisa also mentioned something along these lines. I think it's important to pick a target and have some theory motivation and benchmarks rather than just do things in a completely generic way. Uh, having done that, you should figure out how to probe it and what you need to build in order to do that. And then you build something, and this was the part that Ellen had added, you start small and iterate because there's, you're, you're going to find lots of technical problems and you're also going to find backgrounds even if you didn't expect them and you're going to learn about the backgrounds that you go along. So I think this, is, this is, has been the case with the current dark matter program and it will be the case for all these uh, future uh, things that we sort of plan. So, but that's all good. The other thing that's good luck for us is that many relevant new detecting technologies are appearing now just as we've realized that we need them. And that did not have to be the case, but it is the case. And I want to men mention a very specific uh, uh, version of that, which has to do with quantum technologies. So you may not have heard this, because you're doing your science, but there's a new national initiative called the National Quantum Initiative. Uh, this was passed last year by unanimous voice votes in both the House and the Senate. So how many, how many things have are you been passed by our Congress <laughs> unanimously for the past year? Uh, so this is a big national initiative. I will remind you that historically, physics and astronomy have both benefited greatly from, from past national initiatives, like uh, the Manhattan Project, or more generally World War II, uh, and, and the space race. So we should pay attention to big national initiatives. They will have an effect on us. So let me tell you some of the effects that this is already having that you should care about. So one effect is that people have realized, including funding agencies, that you can use quantum technologies to build quantum sensors. And who are the people that could actually do something right now with, with new quantum sensors? We can do things. We can do dark matter experiments. We can do new dark matter experiments. And we can do them fast and cheap uh, relative to other things that we're doing. And they will take us in, in new directions for our people. So this is something that's already happened. I'm, I'm mentioning some things here in Fermilab, but this is happening in a bunch of different places. And, and our field is now waking up to this. So what's an example of that? Here is a, a dark photon experiment, which is already happening at Fermilab. This is a, a, a variation on the light shining through walls kind of dark photon experiment. So you make a superconducting cavity. You put uh, 10 to the 25 uh, microwave photons in this cavity. And then this cavity is very quiet. It has uh, principal zero photons in there. And then what you're hoping is that some of these guys convert to dark photons that convert back if you see them. You can see them. So this is a kind of experiment. It's, it's, a, it's a quantum technology experiment because of this part, the how do you count single microwave photons in a cavity. So that's why it hasn't been done before. But now that we have the idea to do it, it can be done very quickly. In fact, the first run of this experiment has already happened in Fermilab in a vertical test stand that we usually use for accelerators, and it will happen next year in the Dilution Fringe. And it might make a discovery. Uh, similarly, the people that think about axion searches, and how you, in particular, how do you get to higher masses uh, for axions, are very interested in these quantum technologies. Uh, if you want to do a halo scope uh, QCD axion search in the higher mass range, at some point, you're going to be limited by quantum noise. And in fact, for these searches to be successful, you will need to get orders of magnitude below the standard quantum limit for noise. So this is a real challenge of quantum sensors. Lots of people are getting into this game now, and there's actually devices being built uh, based on these quantum technologies for X-ray searches. So that's a good one. And then the other example that I like is the idea of using atom interferometers. So this is an experiment that is going to be built at Fermilab. It's now fully funded. It's going to happen. This is a 100 meter tall vacuum system that's in a shaft. You're just going to have three atom interferometers driven by a single laser system. So this is a cold atom radiometer. And this is an incredibly sensitive measuring device, as you might imagine. And it will be sensitive to ultralight dark matter, so it's a dark matter experiment. And it's a pathfinder for building a new kind of gravity field detector, among other things. So final words of wisdom. I just had a few quotes that I wrote down here. I hope they have been accurate. Uh, this is something that Saul said when I thought was important to remember. Cosmology is still a pretty young field, so I still expect major new developments on relatively short time scales. I think that's, that's also my prediction. Um, this is, uh, I don't have the context for this, but I still like it as a quote. <laughs> a drunken man will find his way home and a drunken bird is lost forever. I think that's profound. 
<laughs> and then Roger had a good quote yesterday. Discoveries are like burglars. They break in through the side window instead of walking through the front door. That's very true. We should all remember that. And then this morning, I went and grabbed this quote from Jim Peoples' uh, website, because of course, everything he says is very nice. What might we learn from lines of research that are off the beacon tr beaten track? They check accepted ideas, always a good thing, and there is the chance nature has prepared yet another surprise. Thank you all for coming. Go home and solve the universe. <laughs>